And now it's time to meet the men from the ministry. We present Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch in The Men from the Ministry, a weekly tribute to that patient army of public servants through whose efforts government is administered. Selfless men dedicated to service in so many forms, all of which must be completed in triplicate. One of the many functions of the civil service is to back up Britain's defense chiefs as they strive to keep our forces ready for action. Uh, gentlemen, uh, tomorrow's Exercise Water Act has been carefully planned to test the Army's ability to cross a wide stretch of river and hit the enemy for six. Now, I want to check that all preparations are on top line. Marine rescue equipment. Oi, Lanza. Good. Rubberized clothing and waterproof weapons. I'm taken care of, sir. Sea sickness tablets. Oh, you order, sir. Right. Now, can anyone see any snags? Uh... Well, sir... Yes, yes, speak up. Uh, sir, we haven't got any boats. <laughs> Good point. Exercise postponed for a week. Uh, Brigadier Cook, take the war office, get hold of 5,000 light rubber boats. All right, briefing over. Signal here from the army, Mr. Merriman. They want 5,000 light rubber boats for an exercise. Oh, yes, well, get it in hand, would you? You mean buy the boats ourselves? Oh, dear, no, no, no. Would you never learn, Capstick? Pass it on to someone. First rule of administration. <laughs> Pass everything on quickly. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's very urgent. In which case, you pass it on very quickly. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how about uh, general assistance department? That's supposed to help any branch that's busy. Yes, yes. Well, you'll get them through senior liaison officer business. S-L-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 Sir Gregory Pitkin. Yes, he'll tell general assistance department we're too hard-pressed to handle this. Now, let's get back to this eight-letter word beginning with L. <laughs> Lethargy, do you think? <laughs> Hello, General Assistance Department, Richard Lamb speaking. You want what kind of help? No, I'm sorry, that equipment's fully employed already. Goodbye. Who was that? Ministry of Fuel and Power, wanting to borrow our oil stove. <laughs> Honestly, while it seems well at everyone's beck and call. Never mind, to. Remember, we don't have to help with any requests unless they come through Sir Gregory Pitkin. Remember that. So let's get back to the problem on hand. Uh, yes. You know, I think we ought to try an entirely new layout. Why don't we put the waste paper bin over there <laughs> and tip the ball into it with a wedge? Hey, look, man, I've got, a, I've got an awful lot of jobs waiting for me in my office. Besides, you've won three and six already. Ah, <laughs> then. You need practice, my dear boy. You need practice. Yeah, double or quit this time, if you like, and you can use the large American ball. No, no, really. I've got much too much to do. I mean, the plans for the office outing, the poster for the social club's bingo night. So, <laughs> if you excuse me, I think I'll just put off... All one. right, all right. Now, let's assume we're bunkered here behind the filing cabinet. Put the waste paper bin over there. That's it. Bit of risk needed here, I think. Oh, ho, ho. pretty good, although I say it myself. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Hamilton Jones. Well? But the man from the Commonwealth Culture Council is here to see you. Oh, dear, dear, I can't see him today, I'm afraid. Tell him I'm tied up, there's a good girl. Yes. April, pop out, get the midday papers for me, would you please? The racing edition. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. Culture Council, bunch of loafers. Now, let's try that shot again. Oh, dear, I've hit the telephone. Oh, my goodness. Oh. I say, I'm terribly sorry. I sliced my shot, I'm afraid. Hello? Hello? What are you talking oh. about? Is that Hamilton Jones? Oh, oh, is that you, Sir Gregory? Good morning, Sir oh, Look, Gregory. I've got an important job for General Assistance Department. Yes, I'm afraid we're up to our eyes here, Sir Gregory. So the war office. That's why they pass this over to you. Oh. They want you to buy 5,000 rubber boats. My word, that's a lot of boats, isn't it? They're having some kind of regatta? Exercise. <laughs> oh, exercise. Splendid, yes. Some of those war office chaps could do with a bit of exercise. They're flabby, aren't they? Very flabby. A lot of boating will do them good, you These know. These boats are urgently required for an army amphibious exercise. Oh. Look, get your secretary to make a note of it right away. Yes. 
Well, better still, let me speak to her. My secretary, well, I'm always, I'm afraid she's out at the moment, Sir Pitt, Sir Greg, Sir Grog, whatever. Uh, <laughs> she's got out to, uh, to fetch some sporting, uh, important papers. Just write it down yourself, man. Yes. What? Will you make sure you get it right? Yes, I will. 5,000 light rubber boats. Don't go too quickly. 5,000 light rubber boats. Yes, yes. For an army exercise. Yes, well, I'll jot it down on my blotter. And get it in hand immediately. Don't worry, Sir Greg, Sir Pitt. I beg your pardon. Don't worry, don't worry. I'll give it my full personal attention and do give my kind regards to Lady Greg, Lady Pitt, Lady... Oh, dear, better cut us off. Your papers, Mr. Hamilton. Ah, there you are, April. Just had my friend Sir Gregory on the phone. Oh. Wondering if we could help him out with a job. I promised him to have my full personal attention, so I want Mr. Lamb to get on with it straight away. Please. What sort of job is it exactly? Why, oh, do you know, some nonsense from the war office. I've written all the details on my blotter here. I see. I shan't be in for the rest of the day. If War Office ring, tell him I'm at the Board of Trade. And if the Board of Trade ring? Tell him I'm at the War Office. <laughs> Usually works pretty well. Oh, you've got my paper. Spend it, spend it. Goodbye. Get that thing in hand, won't you? Now, what's he written on his blotting pad? 3.30, speedy, Edie can't win. <laughs> hmm. Ah, April, uh, where's H.J.? Gone, Mr. Lamb, to a better place. But he made a note of something he wants you to do. I'm trying to find it on his blotter. Well, perhaps I can help. Let's see. Rejuveno, seven and sixpence a box. Ah, this must be it. Buy 5,000 something for army exercise. Can you make out these three words? Yeah, 5,000 light, uh, looks like rubber boots. <laughs> yes, you're right about rubber. But is that boots, though? Sure to be. I must get this in hand right away. I'll tell my secretary to do it at once. Hadn't we better wait and check with H.J.? No, no, just leave it all to me. I am a chap who makes a decision and acts immediately. Mm, so I noticed the other night. Oh, yes, well, <laughs> I do apologize about that, April. Uh, Miss Adams, uh, I'm afraid it was the effect of the film. You see, all those South Sea Islanders with their primitive orgies and the passion and the color and that fantastic ritual with the love goddess. I, I felt this overwhelming desire to... Hold your hand. <laughs> I do hope you'll forgive me. How about coming out for a spot of lunch today? It's very good of you, Mr. Lambert. That's always... all settled then. I'll just slip into my office and get those boots ordered, and then we'll go. Back in a second. I've got an important job to do, Mildred, and I want you to do it at once. I'm still doing your laundry list, Mr. Lamb. Yes, well, you can leave that now. Anyway, you've got it wrong. The please starch goes against the collars, not the underwear. <laughs> now, this is important. I want you to order 5,000 light rubber boots for dispatch to the war office. <coughs> oh, dear, yes. I, I suppose you don't know what to do, do you? All right, I'll give you a letter. While I'm out, get the name and address of our footwear supplier from the file and send it off. Now, take this in shorthand. Dear sirs, please supply... <coughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, of course, you can't do shorthand, can you? Honestly, I don't know how you got in here. Well, I could do it when I took my test. I mean, I never liked doing it, so I've forgotten. Take it straight down on your typewriter. Ready? Dear sir, please supply us with 5,000 boots, light, rubber, soldiers for the use of war office specifications. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, let me see. S P E. See, as war office usual type. You know, no, rub it out afterwards. Uh, standard sizes, charge, general assistance department, yours, etc. Have you got that? If we are going out to lunch, we'd better go now. Or we'll be late back. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Port my signature on the letter, will you, Mildred? Uh, come along, April. <laughs> I say, I'm so glad you're going to have lunch with me. It's very kind of you to ask me, Mr. Lamb. I hope you're not going to be too extravagant. Not at all. I've got quite enough sandwiches for two. <laughs> I know a jolly good seat on the embankment where we can watch the coal barges go by. Come along. My dear fellow, of course you can have my check. What are you talking about? Just thought you'd sooner wait till Godiva's won the 4.30 today, and then you'll be owing me. Save a lot of paperwork, you know. What? Well, I can't say I like your attitude. I've a good mind to place my bets elsewhere. Where? How dare you talk to me? Now, look here. No, no, no. Oh, no, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. No, no, no. Here, hold on, hold on. Hello. I haven't given you my bet on Godiva yet. Hello, hello. Oh, dear. 
Poor old Godiva, another outing with nothing on. Can't be good for her. <laughs> Sorry to butt in, sir, but the man from the culture council's still waiting to see you. Yes, my sir, I've forgotten all about it. You must be pretty tired of waiting by now. Doesn't seem so, sir. Good, then he won't mind waiting a little longer, will he? Tell him I'm tied up or tied down or both, whatever it is. Very good, sir. Thank you. I just thought he had something better to do than hang round. GAD1? Ah, cut you at last. Oh. Your phone's been engaged for 20 minutes. Oh, yes, Sir Greg, Sir Fifth. I beg your pardon. Uh, yes, uh, Sir Gregory, what can I do for you? I hope you're well and your ladyship. I what about the boats? What about the what again? Oh, boats. What? The war office yes. asked for the 5,000 rubber boats. Oh. Last week. What yes. about it? What about it now? How interesting. Yes, oh, yes, they're all in hand. We're leaving no stone unturned. Well, when are the war office going to have them? Very shortly, I think, Sir Gregory. You can rely on us. When? Oh, very shortly. What was that again? The rubber boats, rubber man. Bo- oh, yes. Tell whoever doesn't work at your place. War office want their 5,000 rubber boats. They want them now. Oh, good heavens. Just a moment, Sir Gregory. <laughs> Miss Adams asked Mr. Lamb to come in, will you? Now, Sir Greg, Sir, are you there? Are you there? I'll have it all buttoned up for you. And my kindest regards to Lady uh, Greg Pitt. Well, yes. Oh, dear, that fellow's comes off again. Rubber boats? I can't remember anything about that. Funny thing to ask for. You must have some kind of regatta, I suppose. Thank you very much, April. Uh, morning, one. If it's about the holiday rota, I've marked you off for the whole of August, as usual. Thank you very much. No, it's about that order we're handling for war office. Top priority job. I hope you haven't forgotten. Oh, yes, they've just been delivered. I was going down to inspect them before sending them off to the war office. Good, good. What sort of size did you order? Uh, standard sizes. I mean, uh... How many men do you think they'll get in each? Oh, I should say that. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Well, obviously they'll aim to get two or three soldiers in each, don't you think? <laughs> well, I know the government are trying to make economies, but that seems ridiculous. Ridiculous? May I ask why? Well, if the army can't give each soldier his own pair of rubber boots, well, I mean, they won't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say rubber boots? That's what we're talking about, isn't it? The 5,000 rubber boots you told me to get there already downstairs. Are you all right, Mr. Hamilton Jones? I think I'll just sit down for a minute. You're right, I'll go and check over the rubber boots. Uh, then we can... Do, the order yes. was for 5,000 light rubber boots. B-O-A-T-S, boots. Uh, we can get them sent to the... Uh, uh, what? <laughs> oh, thank goodness we're both established staff. Established, you may be. <laughs> But remember, Sir Gregory can still have you transferred to records at Inver Glocky. Oh, not that. That's in the Outer Hebrides. He wouldn't do that just for one tiny mistake. Perhaps I might just take the position. War Office urgently want 5,000 rubber boats, which we haven't got. What we have got is 5,000 rubber boots, which nobody wants and we'll have to pay for. Now, if you've got that into your head, you've got it in a nutshell. <sighs> Well, I suppose in the glocky wouldn't be so bad in the warm weather. I'm told they don't have any. Look, why don't you phone the boot people and see if they'll take them back? Good idea, April. Uh, can I borrow the intercom? Uh, Mildred, get the name and number of the firm we got those boots from, will you? And better bring a copy of your letter in as well. I must say, too, I'm very disappointed in you. Have I got to do everything myself? But look here, one. This would never have happened if you'd written it down properly instead of scribbling on your blotter between what? your pool's perm and a... Recipe for homemade gin. Now then, steady, steady, <laughs> steady. Are you still hoping to get a patent carpet in your office? Yes. Well? I'm sorry. I should say so. Here you are, Mr. Lamb. Both dark footwear factory. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, get me uh, upper trace week double four double two, will you, and ask for the manager. Oh, dear, and I thought today would be a happy day. I had a good omen. What was that? Well, while I was shaving, the toast caused fire as usual. Is that good? No, but today the coffee boiled over and put it out. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, Fosdick Footwear, uh, this is the General Assistance Department of the Ministry. Morning, Fosdick here. Get the boots, all right? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. a lovely boot. Worth double the price. Strong, smart, durable. Yes, well, uh, we were wondering if you'd mind taking them back. Never. Take them back. I've had the whole staff on overtime to make them for you. But they're strong, smart, durable, and worth... No, wish. there's no market for them. Apart from anything else, what can I do with 5,000 boots on the same foot? Well, surely you could... <laughs> what did you say? I said there'd be no use to us. It seemed an odd order in your letter. 
We thought you must have a use for them. Odd. What sort of boat or litter? Mildred, let me see that copy. Dear sirs, please supply us with 5,000 boots, right, rubber, soldiers for the use of... Oh, I say... This. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 that's funny. It sounds as if you said right boots. Uh, Mildred, you didn't... Mr. Fosdick, you couldn't... Aye, right, 5,000 right boots. It did seem odd. Like the army up and into battle on one foot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, ours not to reason why, you know. But couldn't you see it was a typing error? Why didn't you query it? Well, we don't query ministry orders. Not since that time he asked for 200 black boots with open toes. <laughs> we queried that, didn't we? And you told us it was for a team of Morris dancers and a British council tour of the Middle East. <laughs> now we just get on with it. Yes, but... Now look here, 5,000 right boots you ordered, and 5,000 right boots you've got. And I'd like my account settled quickly, please. I'll not detain you no longer. Oh. Mildred. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Lowe. I never could get the L and the R sorted out. I think I need a new machine. Yeah, I think you need a... Uh, I'll tell you later. Oh, 5,000 right-footed boots. What are we going to do? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm going out to lunch. I shan't be back this afternoon, Miss Adams. Uh, but when the boots, the war office... I'd say the first thing was to order the rubber boots for the war office and get that side settled. Look here, I'm sure we're entitled to a bigger hat stand, aren't we? <laughs> Have a look into the regulations, will you please, Miss Adams? <laughs> but when this is a crisis, you can't just walk out on it. Well, if you want my advice, I'd say the first thing to do is to order the rubber boots for the war office and get that side settled. Miss Adams, you can see to that. Very good, sir. But what about the boots? How do we pay for them? And what are we going to do with them? Ah, very good question, too. Very neatly put. Have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs> the unflappable man. Only till he realizes that he's going to get it in the neck the same as me. Then the boot will be on the other side of his face. <laughs> when Sir Gregory finds out about this, he'll go through the department like the beast from 20,000 fathoms. No use panicking. But just think when this gets out. Public money sent on 5,000 boots, one-footed, unwanted, no one for the use of. <laughs> There'll be an official inquiry, questions in the house, all that stuff about government waste. Squander bugs at the ministry. There was an article about it in one of the Sunday papers. Oh, the Sunday papers. It said, expose these guilty men. Mildred, <laughs> this is all your fault. Go back to the office and file the redundancy reports. We haven't got any redundancy reports. We have now, and yours is the first one. <laughs> 5,000 boots. 5,000 boots. 5,000 pairs we might have sold, but 5,000 all the same foot is like trying to sell a skipping rope to a man with lumbago. Wait a minute. I think you've got it. What, lumbago? That's the answer. <laughs> You said 5,000 pairs we could sell. Well, obviously, people could use pairs. Well, then all we have to do is to order 5,000 left boots and make up the pairs. April, you're right. You're marvelous. 5,000 left boots to make up the pairs. Then we can advertise them in those Saturday paper postal bargains, you know, <laughs> where they offer things like ex-naval officers' horsehair underwear. <laughs> ex wefs outsized linoleum pajamas. <laughs> oh, there's only one snag. What's that? Will Fosdick help after all this? I mean, could he send 5,000 left boots by Monday before the storm breaks? Oh, of course he will. More overtime for the staff. Quick, what was that number again? Uh, uh, hello, get me Mr. Fosdick at Upper Clayswick 4422, please. 5,000 left boots for Monday. Oh, I hope he can do it. <laughs> Morning, Wilkins. Afternoon, Mr. Hamilton Jones. Yes, I do like to be beside the sea. Morning, Miss Murphy. Afternoon, sir. Yes, I do like to learn the rock. Morning, Miss Adams. Good afternoon, sir. I hope you had a pleasant weekend. Yes, thank you. Mr. Lamb's waiting in your office. Oh, yes, I know what he's worried about. And the gentleman from the Culture Council's in the waiting room again. Good. Best place for him. <laughs> Morning, too. No, good afternoon, ma'am. I hope you had a good weekend. Yes, thanks, my dear boy. Thank you very much. Racing on Friday and Saturday, spotted golf yesterday, had Lord and Lady Westbury round in the evening for cocktails and what's my line. Oh, what fun. Uh, how was the golf? I did rather well, as a matter of fact. I went round the dining room in 42. Oh. <laughs> don't you think it's time you tried a round on the proper golf course? Oh, don't frighten me. All in good time, my dear fellow. Mustn't run before we can walk. 
I must have chip shot at the ninth yesterday, put a bit of a dent in the hi fi speaker. <laughs> Oh, I am sorry. You know, I must get that shot right. Be a good fellow. Shove the paper bin over there, will you? And pass the balls from the filing cabinet. You know, the top secret drawer. That's it, yes. That's right. Thank you. I hope you didn't let our little footwear crisis spoil your weekend. What? What's that? Ernie, I've got some good news for you. Oh. After you'd gone on Friday, I had an idea that I think will solve it. <laughs> oh, that's better. That's more likely. Crisis? Oh, you mean the boot business? I fixed it all on Friday afternoon. No need to get excited about these things, you know. Move the bin back a bit, will you? You fixed the boot business? Yes, of course. Question of getting rid of 5,000 right boots. Is that what you're talking about? I met this fellow in the bar at Sandown. Some kind of dealer, I think he was. He agreed to take the lot. Sent his van to pick him up on Saturday. He, he sent... He, he, he picked... You mean you sold the boots? They've gone? <laughs> Of course he won't pay our price, my boy. Breaking them up, I think, he said. Still, the main thing is we've got rid of them. Nothing as bad as being stuck with a lot of right boots, eh? Oh, I wouldn't bank on that one. Now, you said you had some good news for me. I'm not sure you're going to want to hear it now. I'll just try that shot again. Sorry to interrupt, but I thought you might like to know the 5,000 left boots have arrived. 5,000 left? What? I don't understand. I wonder what the digs are like at Inverglocky. <laughs> hey, mother, here, get you read this on the front page? Great boot scandal. Five million pounds worth of rubber boots, all have put it. Hey, lie rotten in London. Ordered by a government department, they have been neither used nor paid for. When asked about this, a government spokesman, who would not give his name, said he had nothing to say. <laughs> Isn't it marvellous, eh? Five million quid down the drain, and you had to pay ten bob on your new teeth. <laughs> I should like to ask the minister if he is aware of reports that 10 million pounds of public money has been spent on redundant left boots. Uh, uh, several examples of government waste are causing grave public concern, especially these left-footed boots. And I should like to know what steps the government proposes to take in them. <laughs> are going to resign over those boots. Hmm, it's not quite as bad as that, Mildred. They're still giving out that a small number of boots have been stockpiled for reasons it would not be in the national interest to reveal. <laughs> oh. Well, what does that mean? It means they're in dead trouble. <laughs> Sir Gregory's given H.J. 24 hours to find a good use for the boots. After that, it's the axe. The axe? Mm -hmm. You mean Mr. Lamb and H.J.? Behead it. <laughs> in the Tower of London. They wouldn't do that just for... Oh, I hope they let us watch. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just an expression. It means... Oh, I can't stop now. I've really got to do something about this chap from the Culture Council. I'd have to interrupt them, even if they are having a crisis meeting. This is urgent, too. The trickiest problem we've had. We can't relax until we get the answer. Yes, but, ma'am, no, there's no doubt about it, my dear fellow. Don't argue. Look what it says in the newspaper. The competition closes tomorrow. If we can't find those ten pictures of Adam Faith, how can I place them in order of men? <laughs> but the boots. What are we going to do about the boots? I can't understand it. I cut them out every day, one a day for ten days, and tucked them under the telephone. One of that cleaner's in love with him or something and taken them. Honestly, Ron, this department is on the brink of disaster, and all you can think of is winning 50 top twist records of your choice. No, no, no. <laughs> Yo, you're quite wrong there. They're also offering 100 pounds in cash. You can have the records. Oh, oh, oh. You can play them on your island in the Hebrides. Oh. <laughs> Don't remind me. Honestly, I can't see any way out. 5,000 left boots. The mind boggles. 
If there's one thing I hate, it's a boggled mind. <laughs> now, come along, my dear fellow. No use getting excited. Keep calm. You'll find everything will knit together all right. Sorry to interrupt you, sir, but the man from the culture council is still waiting to see I you. I can't possibly see him now. I'm sorry. Far too much on hand. He's been here every day since the week last Monday. Why didn't he have a proper appointment? He did, sir. A week last Monday. Oh. I think we'd better see him, one. We can't afford to upset any more people. All right, then. Show him in. Yes, sir. How do they expect us to get any work done with all these visitors? I don't know. <laughs> well, we shan't be getting many visitors at Inverglocky. The boat only goes out from the mainland every other Tuesday. Now, don't be morbid, too. 24 hours to get rid of 5,000 left boots. That's more than three and a half boots a minute. <laughs> Challoner from the Culture Council. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, oh, nice to see you. I do apologize for keeping you waiting. Bit of a crisis, you know. Not at all. The boot's on the other foot. Oh, no. <laughs> I who should apologize for pestering you. But the Culture Council are organizing this tour of Java, and we heard that you were the people to fit us out. Yes, yes. Well, the thing is, Mr. Oh, Chan... We want you to supply us with tropical kit, mosquito yes. netting, medical supplies, all that kind yes, of yes, thing. Yes, 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 of course. I'm awfully sorry, but you see... Well, we're rather pleased, because this will be the first cultural mission to the Javanese headhunters. Aim is to show them the British way of life. You know, the sort of thing. Discussion groups, midsummer night stream, and, of course, <laughs> bag of sport. Cricket, football. They play a bit of football already, apparently. <laughs> All barefoot, of course. But uh, we're going to teach them to wear boots. Yes, yes, yes. But the point is... Uh, just a minute, uh, Mr. Uh, did you say you were going to get the headhunters to wear boots? After football, you see, more civilized than barefoot. Don't know how they'll take to it, of course. No, it's bound to feel strange at first. Unless, of course, uh, you could get them used to it gradually, you know, say, start them off with one boot each. <laughs> start them off with... I say, what a marvellous idea. You mean, every player has one boot and one bare foot. Yes, yes, that's it. What a good idea. Compromise, you see. Traditional British method of introducing reforms, my dear sir. Oh, you're absolutely right. The, the only stag is, where on earth could one get a large number of boots all the same foot? Well, I don't want to promise anything or make you too excited, but I, I think we might just be able to help you out there. I say, you general assistant chaps are remarkable. You, you sure you don't mind? Not at all. I'll have them delivered with all your other stuff. Oh, splendid. Now, look, I mustn't keep you any longer. I've got to choose the plays we're putting on for the headhunters. I thought Midsummer Night's Dream, the school for scandal. <laughs> and how about one for the pot? <laughs> well, I say you have been. I would cherry, huh? Not at all, cherry. There you are, too. I said you'd find it would all knit together. Yes, but I didn't think we'd find as big a knit as that. <laughs> Now, come along. You better set about getting the supplies for the Culture Council, and I'll phone Sir Gregory and tell him I've saved the day. Oh, good. Splendid. These wrist straps, they make all the difference, you know. Oh, April, just in time. Hand me my ball back. There's a good girl. Don't you think you ought to give some attention to those cheese import licenses? They've been on your desk for three weeks. Now, don't fuss, Miss Alice. Don't fuss. The cheese will be all the better for keeping. Hopefully it got it. <laughs> got it in a cool place, I hope. Well, the Board of Trade were on about it again this morning. The essential thing, you know, in public service is to keep calm. Now, what about that trouble last month with those wretched boots, remember? Suppose I got het up then. Instead, I quietly thought out a solution. Oh, that reminds me. It's time the payment came in from the Culture Council expedition. We need it to balance our accounts. Now, don't worry. Of course it'll come in. Uh, excuse me, one, but the Culture Council payment for those boots has just arrived from Java. Good. We must get it over to the Treasury straight away. You see, I told you, Sir Gregory yes. will be pleased. I wouldn't be too sure of that one. Well, of course he will. they paid in full, haven't they? What are you looking so worried about? Well, I suppose they've paid in full, but I'm not quite certain of the rate of exchange. Rate of exchange, my dear fellow, what on earth are you talking about? Well, I mean, that is, uh, well, how do you work out the value of six tons of coconuts and 50 shrunken heads? What? Oh, my God. What do Sir Gregory oh. say? In this program, the men from the ministry were Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch. Other essential personnel were Roy DeTrice, Diana Olsen, Edwin Epps, David Graham, and Norma Rothall. The men from the ministry is written and produced by Edward Taylor.
And now it's time to meet the men from the ministry. We present Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch in The Men from the Ministry, a weekly tribute to that faithful army of public servants who direct our lives and whose function is illustrated by their ancient crest, two crossed memos and a bowler hat carrying a can. In these times of uneasy peace, one of the problems a government must face is defence. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, does this present arrangement fulfil the complete demands of an early warning system? In fact, let me go further and ask what's the exact purpose of an early warning system? Well, obviously, it's to tell us of any possible hostile approach in time to take defensive action. Yes. Now, does this system we've worked out do that? Yes, I'm sure it does. Any senior official approaching the office will be seen in that mirror we fixed outside your window. <laughs> That is, if they come up the stairs. Yes, and anyone coming down the corridor will step on that sugar we sprinkled on the lino. <laughs> Good. Then we can get on with some golf practice, can't we? Pass my clubs from the map cupboard, would you? Yes, OK. Excuse me, sir. Ah, April, come in. Actually, it's Mr Lamb I wanted to see. I've typed those letters ready for you to sign. Uh, oh, thank you, April, but I asked my secretary to do those. Well, she passed them to me. She had to go out and get her hair done. Oh, did she? Well, she didn't ask me. I'll have a little talk with Mildred when she gets back. I don't think she's coming back today, Mr. Lamb. She said it'd be four o'clock by the time she was done, so she thought she'd go straight home. Oh. I'm afraid Miss Mildred Murphy and I are going to have words. She's been giving herself airs ever since she got picked up by the audience camera in jukebox jury. <laughs> I think she's about due for a large rocket. Now, now, too, let's not have any unpleasantness. Pop the ball on the carpet and we can try chipping it into the bottom drawer. Hello, General Assistance Department, Mr. Hamilton Jones' office. Is she there? Oh, yes, yes, he is, Sir Gregory. It's for you, sir. I'm afraid it's Sir Gregory. Dear me, the one line of attack we didn't think of. Hello, hello, Sir Gregory. Nice to hear from you. How are you? Look, what's General Assistance Department doing at the moment? Well, we're keeping the ball rolling, you know. Are you? Well, I want you to put all other work aside at once. There's an important job come right down from cabinet level. Oh, dear me. Tell me, what do you feel about Britain's part in the space race? Well, we must leave no stone unturned, mustn't we? I mean, no Avenue 1, whatever it is, yes. What exactly, <laughs> um, what exactly is the space race? To come do? along, man. America and Russia have sent men up into outer space. Oh. Now, people are looking to us. This is where you come in. Oh, good gracious. Surely. <laughs> Sir Gregory, isn't it a job for a younger man? I mean, my number two here. He'll volunteer, I'm no, sure. No, no, no. We're not proposing to shoot you off into space. Oh. Or anybody else, for that matter. Well, there's no prospect of getting an Englishman up there for a very long time. Well, in that case, Sir Gregory, I'd be proud to go. <laughs> the PM's under fire because Britain hasn't done enough in the space business. I see. Well, we can't spare the money to do any extra. But we can give publicity and much more of it to what we are doing. Oh, oh, oh very cunning, very cunning, It's Sir not Gregory. meant to be cunning, man. It's just common sense. Oh, yes, very cunning common sense, I see. <laughs> Quite right, Sir Gregory. Now, this is your job. Yes. For the moment, you'll become the Space Information Bureau. That's interesting. You'll have to collect and coordinate reports from all our different research centres and send out a weekly bulletin to the press. You and Lamb can meet the Buffins in my office tomorrow. Let's say 10.30. Yes, yes. very good, Sir Gregory. And kind as regards to Lady... Oh, he's gone. <laughs> what was that one? Work of extreme national importance, too. Something you can really get your teeth into. What a pity we had to be in when he ran up. <laughs> <laughs> Startling experiments at Stoke Newington Laboratory have shown that in extremely cold temperatures in outer space, it will be extremely difficult to keep warm. <laughs> I think that's the lot. How many weeks have we been sending out these bulletins, April? It's four now, isn't it? And how much of this stuff has actually found its way into the papers? Well, there were those two lines in the Dumbartonshire Weekly Advertiser. Exactly. <laughs> and nothing in the national papers at all. That's not surprising, is it? I mean, it's all very well Sir Gregory saying get publicity. There's no facts to get publicity for. Just stringing together a lot of junk, calling it the Space Research Bulletin and sending it out dramatically on the teleprinter doesn't fool the papers. You're quite right, of course. Look at the high spot in this week's bulletin. It can now be revealed that Britain made a major contribution to the successful American space rocket recently sent up from Cape Canaveral. Two small nuts in the capsule's right fin were made in Birmingham. <laughs> yes, well, if we had some real news, they'd print it quickly enough. 
Oh, Mr Lamb? Yes, Mildred, what is it? Look, I'll have to finish sticking those snaps in your album this afternoon. I'm going off to lunch now. You're not, Mildred. You know very well your lunch hour is until 1.30. Miss Adams and I have to go first. But I've got to go up to the West End and buy a new dress for my party. Sort of a coming out dress. Certainly not. You're coming out of that one quite sufficiently. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I've been meaning to speak to you about wearing more suitable clothes for the office and about punctuality. I expect you to get here at the proper time, go for lunch at the proper time and leave at the proper time. What did your last slave die of? <laughs> that will do, Mildred. Once and for all, you cannot go to lunch now. It'd mean leaving the office empty. Well, what about Mr H.G.? He hasn't come in at all yet. That's quite enough. I'm bound to say, Mildred, your whole attitude to Rife is wrong. All you seem to care about is having a good time. If you go on like this, you'll probably find yourself redundant. Oh, what a thing to say. How dare you? <laughs> that does it. I'm going out now and I shan't come back till I feel like it. Yeah, uh, Mildred, come back. Mildred! Well, would you believe it? She's going to get the biggest rocket she's ever had when she gets back. Yes, Mr. Lamb. Do you want to add any more to this bulletin? Oh, but jolly good... Uh, uh, the bulletin? No. No, it's all ready to go off to the teleprinters. I suppose we'd better let H.J. see it first. He's rather lost interest since none of the first three got in the papers, but he still likes to tell his chums he's head of space research. Well, pop it on his desk, will you? And then we'd better go and have lunch. Ought we to leave the office empty? If we don't go now, all the hot dishes will be off in the canteen. <laughs> Besides, H.J. will be here at any minute. Then you'd better leave him a note. Remind him teleprinters need the bulletin by 1.30. Oh, good idea. Uh, can I borrow your pencil? Yeah. Now then, uh, a space research bulletin to be sent off at 1.30. And you ought to explain why Mildred's not here. Oh, yes, and warn him she's due for a big rocket. Yes. If there's going to be a row, he'll want to make sure he's not here. I'll say, <laughs> big rocket in the air. Uh, Mildred shot off early this morning. <laughs> what time did she go? Mm, about one <coughs> o'clock, perhaps a bit before. Yes, one or bit before. And I'll just add, Mildred must be brought down to Earth. I'll leave it on his desk. Come along, April. Wednesday's Shepherd's Pie Day in the canteen. Morning, Miss Murphy. Morning, Miss Adams. How are you, bright and early this lovely morning? Hello, there's no one about. They shouldn't all be as late as this, should they? What's the time? Good gracious, 20 to 2. They've probably gone to lunch, of course. Yes, think I'll do the same. Nobody can say I haven't put in an appearance. Uh, excuse me, sir. Hello, who are you? Uh, from Teleprinters. It's oh. gone half past one, sir, and we haven't had the weekly space bulletin yet. Bulletin? Oh, yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Help yourself, will you? I think you'll find it's on my desk over there. That's where they usually put it. I must be off. My staff will be back if you want any questions. Oh, isn't it marvellous? This desk looks like a jumble sale. Ah, oh, space research bulletin to be sent off at 1.30. Oh, this must be it. <laughs> Well, Jack, um, what do you think? We could keep this from the midday edition, push the rest to the middle pages and run a new headline on the Paris story. Well, you're the news editor. I'd say it wasn't very strong for the four o'clock paper. What are we expecting? Let's see the schedule. Hmm, official report on Britain's space programme. Any hopes? Mm, no, no, no. It's just a weekly handout. It takes 200 words to say uh, we're not doing anything. <laughs> and, um, it'll be coming through on the teleprinter now. Oh, might as well have a look. Yes, yes. All right, let's see. Hmm... There it goes. Report from Government Space Bureau. <laughs> Big rocket in the air. Mildred shot off early this morning. <laughs> hey, well, what's this? Something's up. Big rocket in the air. Mildred shot off early this morning. One orbit before Mildred must be brought back to Earth. <laughs> Ye gods, <laughs> at last we're doing something in space. There's our lead, yes, huh? You bet. Um, uh, Mike, ring up these information people. We've put a rocket into space. Code name Mildred. No, no, better still, I'll ring them myself. Somebody um, find me the number, quick. <laughs> Hello, no sign of H.J. yet? Yes, there is. Look, his umbrella. He's been in and gone out to lunch. Oh, good. Then he'll have sent the bulletin down to the teleprinters. What about Mildred, I wonder? Looks as if she's been in, too. There's an envelope on your desk in her handwriting. Let's see. Mr. R. Lamb, Esquire, Room 24, General Assistance Department, 308 Whitehall, London, SW1, England, by hand. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mr. Lamb, I regard what you said this morning was rude, not fair, and furthermore, a diabolical liberty. I shall not come back until you have apologised or else said you're sorry. If you are ready to do so, you can leave a message with my ma. I will be going round Mars at four o'clock. Yours, M. Murphy. Uh, all right, I'm nearest. Hello, Space Information Bureau. Uh, Peterson, news editor, evening banner, yeah? Oh, it's Peterson. Uh, how nice to hear from you. Now, look, can you give us some information about this big rocket? Well, of course, uh, 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 which big rocket? Well, this morning's big rocket. Um, what was the name we were given? Ah, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, Mildred. Oh, the Mildred business. Good gracious, you press boys get onto everything, don't you? The Mildred uh, was fired this morning, I understand. Uh, not exactly fired, sort of shot off, you know. <laughs> Right, all right, uh, shot off, but uh, this was very sudden, wasn't it? Not really. We've been building up to it for some time. Look, uh, where's Mildred now? Uh, where's Mildred now? I'm not too sure. Wait a minute, though. We've just had a message. Hold on a moment. April, the evening banner are trying to dig up some dirt on that row with Mildred. She must have got onto them. Amazing how anything that happens in a government office is news. Yes, still they told us to cooperate. Where's that note from Mildred? Here you are. Ah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson, mm -hmm. I'll read you the latest message on Mildred's whereabouts. The exact words are, we'll be going round Mars at four o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be going round... Holy smoke, did you say round Mars? Yeah, uh, yeah, round Mars, that's right, yeah. Hold it, we've got to print this straight away. Hey, Wilson, set up a special edition. Mildred is going round Mars. <laughs> I can't think why they're so interested. <laughs> Anything else you want to know, Mr. Peterson? Oh, well, there certainly is. Is Mildred British? Oh, yes, Mildred's British, all right. Yeah, absolutely all British. Yeah, how do you mean? Well, I was wondering if uh, any part of Mildred belonged to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was an American soldier once who... <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'm quite sure there isn't. Oh, splendid. Oh, and there's one other detail the public are sure to want. What's the reason for the name Mildred? Why did it have to be a girl's name? Why did it... Uh, uh, what? <laughs> well, I imagine her parents took the doctor's advice. <laughs> parents? Oh, wait a minute. You, you can't possibly mean... Is Mildred a, a girl? Oh, I think... Uh, is what? Is Mildred a girl? Well, we hate to give firm opinions here at the Ministry, but I can say all available evidence points to the fact. This is fantastic. Wilson, hold that special edition. So, Mildred is a girl, and she's in this thing? In what thing? This rocket. Yeah, of course. She's right in the middle of it, yes. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Peterson, I really must hang up. We're in the middle of an important meeting. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Amazing how some people waste time. <laughs> Excellent lunch, I thought, Crumpton. Yes, very good. Club food's looking up. New chef, you know. Foreign fellow, I'm afraid. Still, uh, you've got to hand it to him, haven't you? Well, back to the office now, I suppose. Comes from Paris, I think. Wife and I are off to Paris shortly. Mm, you taking a taxi? Oh, no, my dear friend, I think we'll go by air. <laughs> I mean, are you taking a taxi back to your office? I beg your pardon. Yes, yes, of course. You are taking a taxi? No, I don't take taxis. I walk. I enjoy the walk. Don't a matter of hundred yards oh, or so. Oh, good. You know. I go your way. I'll join you. Good, good. Interesting stuff you mentioned at lunch, H.J. Mm hmm? So your department keeps tabs on space research. That's right, yes. Under your hat, of course. But actually, the PM's asked me to look after the whole business. Has he? By Joe. Yes. The idea is to have one key man coordinating all the different research centres, you know. Lot of work and worry, isn't oh, it? Oh, good gracious, never stops. Never stops. And not the sort of thing you can leave to juniors, either. But I see it as a challenge. Paper, special edition, Britain space woman sensation. Hello, what's all this? Thank you, sir. Good gracious. What is it? Look at this. Britain launches world's first space woman. UK rocket orbits Mars. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yes, it is, isn't it? Yes. Not that any surprise to you, of course, oh, eh? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, your line of country, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I must say you kept very quiet about it over lunch. Yes, did I? Yes, I did, didn't I? Yes. Uh, <laughs> heavens, I wish I'd read that bulletin. Hmm? Uh, well, p protocol, you see. Oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Remarkable. And you knew about it all the time. Well, naturally. I mean, it's our project, isn't it? <laughs> well, what a dark horse you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How big is this rocket? How big? Oh, well, very big, yes. Oh, very big indeed. 
What do you think? Well, it has to be, you know. It's got a long way to go, hasn't it? <laughs> do you know how far it is to... Uh, where was it again? Mars. Oh, yes, Mars, yes. Mm. Do you know how far it is to the planet Mars? No, no, I don't. Neither do I. But it's a very long way. Fascinating to get the inside story like this <laughs> from someone who knows all the technical yeah. side. Oh, yes, very technical business, of course. And what about the girlie? The girlie? The, the girlie in the rocket. How was she chosen? Oh, there's a girlie in the. Oh, that girlie, yes, that of course, girlie, I yes. beg your pardon. Well, exhaustive tests, you know, oh, really? years of training. What's propelling this rocket? Mm -hmm. Solid fuel, steady feed, parallel rocket arrangement, or supercharged variable jets with thermonuclear boosters? Uh, well, it's not quite so simple as that. <laughs> Uh, I must say, I take my hat off to you scientific chaps. But tell me, what kind of heat shield have you oh, used I'm in this particular... I'm awfully sorry, uh, Grumpton, some of these details are a bit hush. hush ah, you look too much precise. This is my door. I have to dash in and get a bit lost if I'm not there. Of course, <laughs> of course. Good to see you, Grumpton. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank goodness you're back when the office has been going mad. Oh, I'm not surprised, really, too. You might have told me about this space rodic. Undersecretary of the Admiralty asked me about it on the way back from the club, and, of course, I knew nothing. You know I don't read that wretched bulletin. I had to bluff pretty hard, I can tell you. What do you mean, you had to bluff? You were the one who sent off the news. What? I didn't even know there was a space rocket till all the phones rang at once. Where was it launched from? When would it be back? I'm the one who had to do the blood. In the end, we had to leave the receivers off. We've been waiting for you to come and tell us what it's all about. Me, my dear chap, all I know is what's in the newspaper. Oh, it's in the papers. Good. Oh, it must be all right then. Yes, look, we can get most of the facts from the front page. Look at the front page. A dramatic government bulletin at 1.30 announced that Britain has put a woman into space and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. They don't seem to give many details. No, that's the trouble with these wretched government people. They never tell you. <laughs> Just a minute, there's something wrong here. Yes, there is, but I can't quite put my finger on it. We're not supposed to get these facts from the papers. They're supposed to get them from us. But how can they if we haven't got any? That's a point. <laughs> no, two, you're going round in circles. This 130 bulletin's the thing we issue. They did get their facts from us. Oh, then that's all right, then. <laughs> We're reliable enough. Now then, now then. <laughs> Take a grip on yourself, too. Now you're agreeing the rocket news was in our bulletin. Only if you edited. it. The bulletin I wrote was the usual load of old rubbish. That's right, I read it. Thank you, April. <laughs> My dear fellow, how could I have added it? I didn't even see it. But I put it on your desk as usual. What? In fact, look, it's there now. It's right there where I... Oh. Oh, it... If the space bulletin's still on your desk, what got sent round to the teleprinters? You better ring and find out. Oh, dear. Hello, get me teleprinters, will you? I'm beginning to get the screaming nudges again. <laughs> Teleprinter speaking? Yeah, this is the Space Information Bureau. What did our 130 bulletin say? Oh, hang on, I've got it here. Uh, big rocket in the air. Mildred shot off early this morning. <laughs> One orbit before Mildred must be brought back to Earth. Oh. Did you get that? Right between the eyes. <laughs> Can you tell us how you got that bulletin? I got it off the desk like the man told me. Thank you. What is all this? Can you understand it? I'm afraid I'm getting a ghastly glimmer. Look, one, when you weren't in by lunchtime, I left you a note. <laughs> and so that, as I see it, is how we come to be the first people to put a clangor into orbit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 dear, 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 my dear fella. So there's nothing up there at all. Your face will be red in the morning, too. More likely deathly white. While you were out, I confirmed the news to 15 papers and acknowledged congratulations from the Turkish embassy. <laughs> <laughs> what a good thing you're on the established staff. You'll probably get away with a transfer to records in the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> if only you'd got back from lunch sooner. My dear fellow, I was having a very important chat with the Undersecretary of the Admiralty, telling him about this rocket, you see, and... Oh, yeah, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Miss Adams, fetch that little bottle from the first aid cabinet, will you please? The smelling salts? Don't be silly, the brandy. <laughs> I'm glad you realise the position. I realise that through your staggering incompetence, I've been boasting to a senior colleague about a rocket that doesn't exist. Do you realise I shan't be able to show my face in the club again? Oh, bother your club. Do you realise your department's responsible for an entirely false story being shouted by every paper from Land's End to John the Groats? Not to mention every radio and TV from New York to Vladivostok. In fact, the <laughs> whole situation couldn't be more bloody Vostok. <laughs> when they find out the truth, Britain will be humiliated, the government will be exasperated, and 
We'll be obliterated. I think I'll just go and lie down for a minute. Oh, I put the receiver back on the phone. Oh, this is absolute. Hello? Space Information Bureau? Ah, oh, Hamilton Jones, sir. It's for you, sir. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Hello, hello. Hamilton Jones here. Ah, Crumpton here. Oh, Crumpton. At the Admiralty. At the Admiralty, yes. Uh, about this uh, rocket. The rocket, yes. Perhaps I'd better explain. Oh, no need for that. <laughs> when I got back and tried to surprise the First Lord of the Admiralty, I found he knew all about it. Yes, well, of course, we all... What? <laughs> What did you say? The First Lord. <laughs> Said naturally, he'd been on it from the very first thing. He has? The press had been on, of course. <laughs> Wanted to know what arrangements were made for picking up this astronaut when she gets back. Oh, my goodness. The First Lord told them that he's already diverted the whole home fleet for the job. Good Lord. <laughs> eh? I mean, uh, good for him, good for the Lord. <laughs> good for the First Lord. Oh, right, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, but, Jim. Uh, just between you and me, you know, he was flattered in a bit. Oh. Our information on the return arrangements, you know, they're not quite uh, to hand. I see. We've got the general picture, of course, but uh, could you remind us exactly where the capsule's coming down? The capsule coming down? Yes, where? Where? Oh, yes, the North Sea. <laughs> Can you be a little more exact? Yes. <laughs> the South. <laughs> South? Yes, as to say, the South North Sea. <laughs> Summer off East Anglia, we think. Do you know that coast at all? Very bracing. Yes, yes. Well, uh, thank you, Hamilton Jones. We'll get the home fleet there immediately. I don't wish to sound disrespectful, one, but have you gone stock staring bonkers? Oh, on the contrary, I've suddenly seen the light. But you let him believe the rocket is up. You even told him where it was coming down. Look, if we admit this mistake, we're in trouble, right? Right. So why admit it? Well, it's against all decency and ethics to conceal a mistake. Unless you're quite sure you can get away with it. <laughs> exactly. And on the phone, I realise we just might get away with it. But how can we get away with it? There are hundreds of people who'd know if a rocket had been fired, and as soon as they know, they'll know they don't know. But will they dare admit it? You didn't, I didn't, the First Lord of the Admiralty didn't. We're all afraid it was in some dispatch we hadn't read nor to have read, so we pretended we did know. Oh, dear, I don't like the sound of this. Well, remember, we've got nothing to lose. April, bring me all the files on Russian and American space flights, will you? And where's that Mildred girl? She'll be at her mother's by this time. Then, for heaven's sake, go and find her before the press get hold of her. All right. Two, take those receivers off again. Tell the doorman not let anyone up to this office. Just give me time to think. Don't bother answering the door, Ma. It's the big fight coming up on telly. Oh, whatever's happening? We're interrupting television's visit to All In Wrestling at the Athenaeum for our hourly, <laughs> our hourly bulletin on Britain's space rocket. Agency messages now suggest that the world's first woman in space is not a trained astronaut, but a typical London typist. Oh, did you hear that, Ma? Oh, I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> However, it's now known that the girl who should at this moment be orbiting the planet Mars, is a civil service secretary who volunteered for the job. She's a 19-year-old Londoner, and her name is Mildred Murfin. Oh! <laughs> Did you ever? It is me. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Murfin. Mildred, come along with me. Oh, it's you, April. Hmm? Yeah, did you hear that? They think I've been shot into space. You'll be shot somewhere else if you don't come back to the office at once. Honestly, one, how long do you think we can keep this up? As long as you've got the good sense to lie low and let them all get on with it. There have been three special editions of the papers already and nobody's smelt a rat yet. But aren't they going to want some details soon? Details, my dear boy, what they want with details are quite happy making up their own. Look at this latest paper. Thanks, I'd rather not. Nonsense, nonsense, look at this. Full of good stuff. Listen to this. Tense, pale, but doggedly courageous, Mildred Murfin flies on. Yes. <laughs> it is remarkable, isn't it? They filled the whole front page without knowing anything at all. <laughs> Shares leap on the stock exchange. Tonight's TV programme's cancelled. Dimbleby stands by. <laughs> Look, it's, it's spread to the middle as well. I was Mildred's first date by Albert Boggis. <laughs> It's amazing. Do you know, I'm beginning to believe all this myself. Look here, look here. Look in the stop press column. This is our best hope yet. What is it? Questioned about the rocket at his home this afternoon, the Minister of Science seemed to be taken by surprise. But he said we're all very pleased. I can say nothing more at the moment. <laughs> oh, 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 if we're up the creek, we've got a cabinet minister in the same boat. 
The government can't afford to let the truth out now. Look, man, all these people are British. They want to believe in the rocket. What about the American and Russian tracking stations? They see there's nothing there. They've got the most up-to-date equipment. Yes, but they're still manned by old-fashioned human beings. Keep your fingers crossed, too. I don't get it, Dexter. The British rocket should be on this bearing. But look, there's not a thing on the screen. Uh, better tell the news agencies. Hey, Professor, news yeah. flash from Moscow. They say they're picking up the British rocket loud and clear on their new high-powered people's telescope. Oh, oh, they are, are they? Yeah. Well, uh, let's take another look at this screen. Uh-huh. Hey, hey, I can see something. Look there, see? Yeah, yeah, you're right, Professor. It's coming up real clear. And here's our latest bulletin. Russia's scientists have sighted Britain's rocket in orbit. Giving this news, Moscow Radio paid tribute to the astronaut Mildred Murfin, descended, they said, from Russian grandparents. <laughs> American tracking stations have also seen the rocket, and Jodrell Bank, at first unable to detect it, now reports the clearest picture of all. <laughs> the Prime Minister told a crowded house he was justly proud of Britain's space achievement. It showed, he said, what the ship of state could do once it rolled up its sleeves. <laughs> Meanwhile, Britain's Space Information Bureau remains strangely silent. They are thought to be delaying further statement until after the astronauts return, which they are awaiting with quiet confidence. Stand by for further bulletins. No, no honestly. Now no, then, pull yourself yeah, together, for heaven's sake. Getting this again. Pull yourself together. It's no use, man. Getting away with it so far has only made it worse. Now the whole world's waiting to see the rocket come back. And so they shall, my dear fellow, so they shall. But how can they? We'll have to say it burnt up in space. Mildred can go to South America under a different name and we'll send her postal orders. Do you mind, Mr. Lamb, South America? That'll do, Mildred, that'll do. Now, according to my plan, you'll go no further than South End. Listen, everyone. I've been studying the way these other astronauts got back and I think I've got the answer. Two. Ring customs and excise and borrow one of their launches, will you? April, pop into Harridge's and buy a yellow rubber dinghy. Mildred, I'm relying on you to show all the courage and intelligence of which I know you're capable. Do what? I want you to do as you're told. <laughs> now, listen carefully. Hello, America. Hello, the world. This is Ed Burrows reporting to you from London, England. Reporting the three words you've been waiting to hear. Mildred is back. Mildred Murfin, the world's first woman astronaut, has returned from orbiting the planet Mars. Let me give you the details so far as they are known. Through a slight miscalculation, Mildred came down not in the North Sea, where so many sailors were waiting to pick her up. <laughs> but in the deserted Thames estuary. <laughs> Here she was rescued by the foresight of Space Information Bureau's Roland Hamilton Jones, who was patrolling this very area in a launch. <laughs> Only a few lucky spectators on historic South End Pier saw Mildred Hall from her rubber dinghy. Tragically, the capsule itself with old data and records of this historic fright had already sunk to the bottom of the sea. Reports say Mildred is in good shape, but her immediate boss, Mr. Richard Lamb, was taken to hospital suffering from nervous exhaustion. <laughs> and so a new page is written in the history of man's endeavor. How are you feeling now, too? Well, the week's rest has done me good, but I still dread getting found out. And after all that international hoo-ha about Britain's space triumph, not to mention the rewards we've had from the grateful government, that new hat stand in your office, <laughs> my five days sick leave without a certificate. <laughs> Mind you, I thought they were a bit over-generous with Mildred. You mean that free book of lunch and vouchers? <laughs> anyway, you needn't worry, too. The whole thing's past history now. We'll never get a tougher assignment. I wouldn't be too sure, one. This was just come from the Prime Minister. Oh, thank you. Let me see. Delighted with your success. Getting a rocket to Mars suggests you can cope with really difficult problems. 
I therefore appoint you Road Congestion Council. <laughs> Report Mr. Marples at once. Oh, no, two. This is too much. Well, it looks like yes, well. In this programme, the men from the Ministry were Wilfred Hyde-White and Richard Murdoch. Other essential personnel were Diana Olson, Norma Ronald, Roy DeTrice, David Graham and John Graham. The Men from the Ministry is written and produced by Edward Taylor. And now it's time to meet the men from the Ministry. We present Wilfred Hyde-White and Richard Murdoch as the men from the Ministry, a weekly tribute to all those who work in government offices and to all the others who spend their days there as well. We are concerned, as usual, with the general assistance department, that tireless body which exists to help any other department that's overloaded. This week we find them attached to the Ministry of Aviation, and as we join them in their office, high over Whitehall, they are studying the problems of aerodynamics. Whatever you say, I'm convinced that one has the greatest potential for long-distance flight. I'm not denying that, but the point is endurance isn't everything. One ought to consider style, grace, elegance. That's why I prefer this one. Well, I must admit she's rather beautiful. I mean, that wingspan's quite remarkable, mm, isn't the it? The body seems ideally proportioned, And look at the it? tail, my dear. Yes. Hello. I say, quite a minute, one. What is it, Rosamund? I think she's going to lay an egg. <laughs> I believe you're right. Oh, I say. Oh, yeah. oh, bravo, my word. What a surprise. Well done, Victoria. I say we must let Sir Gregory see this. Oh, no. Did you get that memo he sent round last week? Said that staff were not to encourage pigeons on the windowsill. Yes, I'm afraid I toyed up and threw it out of the window. Did you really? Actually, those two birds collected some of the pieces and used them to line their nest. Mm. Well, now we know why they built the nest anyway. And we know which is Victoria and which is Albert. That'll cost you half a crown, too. I'd like to know how you guessed. I had a feeling the lady was the one that seemed dissatisfied with the nest and kept sending the other fellow for more tweaks. Ah, well, they're certainly a handsome couple. Yes, they are. And right. I'll bet they're jolly proud of that egg. Matter of fact, so am I. Nice to think they picked my window so to start a family. In fact, I think this calls for a little celebration. I'll get the brandy from the first aid cabinet. Good. Bring a biscuit or something, would you? OK. Better let Victoria and Albert join the party. Besides, you've got to build your strength up, Victoria. <laughs> That's right. And you take good care of her, Albert. Yes, I'm not surprised you look pleased with yourself. <laughs> Here we are. Two glasses of brandy and a suggestive biscuit. Thank you, now tell what we'll do. <laughs> we'll just break the biscuit in half, dip it in the brandy... Oh, wow, that's vandalism. No, no, not at all, my dear friend. I said the pigeons must join the celebration. Break the biscuit, drop oh. it on the sill, like that. There you are. Now, that's better than you get into Falga Square, isn't it? There you are. You see what I tell you? They like it. Oh, 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 you rascals. You like it, don't you, you rascals? Well, cheers, too. Cheers, son. Oh, I hope you're doing the right thing with that booze-sodden biscuit. Of course I am. What are you talking about? They love it. Look, look. No, well, whatever you say, one, I can't believe alcohol's good for him. And just when he should be taking seriously his responsibilities as a parent. Now, don't fuss. Well, there he goes. He's taken off again. Look. Lucky Sir Gregory's gone indoors. Well, what did I tell you? He's definitely unsteady in his flight. Who's unsteady? What are you talking Oh, Albert, I see. Yes, I suppose he is a bit. <laughs> Look at him. Instead of his usual graceful glide, what's he doing? Oh. Lurching drunkenly across the sky. Yes, look, he won't come to any harm, will he? Well, I wouldn't be too sure. He's faltering a bit. Oh, oh, my goodness, he's gone into a nosedive. You're right, my dear boy. Oh, look, he, he, he's completely out of control. He's going to hit the middle of Whitehall at 100 miles an hour. I can't look, I can't look. What's happening? He's crashed in the middle of the road. I think he might... Oh, oh! What is oh, it? What yeah. is it? What is it? Not a, not a... Yes, an 88 bus. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> It was a very quick way to go. My dear fellow, I'll never forgive myself. That brandy, oh dear, what was I thinking of? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. 
Poor Victoria. Did she see, do you think? I don't think so. She's looking a bit bottled herself. <laughs> <laughs> She'll just assume that he's left her. What a terrible thing. All my fault. There, there, Victoria. We'll have to look after you now. <laughs> Now, listen, April, Mildred, we've asked you to come here because we want to talk to you. I'm afraid we're faced with a sad and tricky situation. Oh, sir, whatever is it? Now, Victoria, the pigeon on my windowsill, has lost her husband. Oh, dear, how did that happen? I think you might say he went into a sudden decline. Yes, 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 you might say that. <laughs> but for various reasons, Mr. Lamb and I feel somewhat responsible. You see, this has just happened when Victoria's sitting on her first egg. That means she'll have no mate to bring her food. Well, it doesn't work quite that way. You see, normally the lady pigeon and the gentleman pigeon take it in turns to sit on the egg. That way, each gets time off to feed. But now, poor Victoria's got to work both shifts. So, the effect is the same. She won't get any food. How do you know all this, Mr. Lamb? Mr. Hamilton Jones and I have invested in this small booklet. So You Want to Keep Pigeons by Albert Grundy. We thought it essential to find out all about it. Uh, you see, we feel until its egg hatches safely, the welfare of this pigeon is our responsibility. And yours, we hope. Of course. I'll do all I can to help. Oh, me too. Good. Now, the first problem is the feeding business. As we said, this bird is liable to starve because there's no mate to share the job of sitting on the egg. Mildred, this is where you can help. Oh, Mr. Lamb. <laughs> I'd never get out on that windowsill. <laughs> Mildred, we don't expect you to sit on it yourself. Victoria will do that. But we've got to feed her. Now, according to the book, the best diet is millet and cod liver oil. I want you to go out and buy some of both, then mix them up and knead the mixture into little paste balls, and we'll keep a supply on number one's desk. All right? Yes, Mr. Lamb. Good. Now, Mr. Lamb and I will be responsible for actually giving the bird food and water, but we must all be responsible for protecting Victoria from our enemies. Enemies? Yes, enemies, those who wish our harm. Mr. Lamb and I have discussed this carefully, and we've decided there are three special dangers. Isn't that right? Yes, yes. They are, um, oh, we wrote it down somewhere, didn't we? Got uh, I've got it, yes. Uh, the three main sources of danger to Victoria are Sir Gregory Pitkin, yes. the window cleaner, and Neutron, the caretaker's cat. If Sir Gregory looks in at any time, he must be detained in the outer office as long as possible, while whoever's in here carries out Operation Screwboard. Operation Screwboard? Yes, Mr. Lamb's found that enormous notice board you see over there. Mm -hmm. Operation Screwboard consists of screwing it up so it completely conceals the small window where Victoria's sitting. But it'll cut half the light. Won't Sir Gregory notice the change? Now, that's a risk we'll have to take. Fortunately, Sir Gregory's been in public service a number of years, so he's not quite as bright as the normal... Well, you know what I mean. Anyway, there are other windows, aren't there? Ah, but remember, if ever Sir Gregory sees the nest, it'll be curtains for Victoria and a big rocket for us. Yes, 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 remember that. But with any luck, of course, he may not come away at all. The window cleaner, on the other hand, will certainly do so. Yes, it's the second Wednesday in the month, so any minute now he'll come marching in to have a go at the windows. That's not the only thing he likes to have a go at. Exactly. We all recall last month I had to speak rather sharply to the window cleaner because of his familiarity with April here. Well, it was partly her own fault, really. She should have known better than to lean out the window when he pointed. Be that as it may. The window cleaner now bears us a grudge. He knows the rule about pigeons, and if he spots Victoria, he's sure to report it to Sir Gregory. Well, you can't put the notice board up when he comes. He knows how many windows there are. Exactly. We'll have to be a little more subtle. This time it's up to you, April. Me? Yes. You know he fancies you. The idea is for you to meet him in the corridor before he gets here, chat him up a bit, and encourage him to take you round to the El Inferno coffee bar for an illicit cappuccino. That'll put him behind schedule, and he'll have to skip our floor to catch up. You mean I've got to play up to that chamois leather Romeo? I'm very sorry, April. You can imagine how I feel asking you to do a thing like this, but when you think of that little feathered widow huddled up in her nest, straining herself to hatch her egg... All right, Mr. Lamb, say no more. I'll do it. Good. I knew you'd rally round, April. I say, isn't it exciting having something really important to do? <laughs> April, I've got some more pigeon food for Mr. H.J. Oh, jolly good. I doubt if Victoria's finished the first lot yet. Here, I've been meaning to ask you, hmm? how did you get on with that cheeky window cleaner yesterday? Oh, we spent an hour in a dark corner of the coffee bar holding hands. Holding hands? That was fast work on his part. No, it was self-defence on mine. <laughs> 
Anyway, pigeon and egg was saved, so I suppose it was all worthwhile. Trouble is, he's asked me to go out for a drive tonight, in his van. Said he knows a quiet spot in the country. Oh, isn't he awful? Would you like me to go instead? <laughs> now, that is a good idea, Mildred. I was supposed to meet him at El Inferno at six o'clock. All right. Just to help a friend, you understand. <laughs> Thanks very much. His name's Walter, by the way. All right, April. How's the pigeon getting on? Mm. Quietly confident, I think. Our bosses, on the other hand, are in a state of great excitement. H.J. didn't leave till five o'clock last night. And Mr. Lamb says he was in at ten this morning to give Victoria her first feed. <laughs> if they go on keeping eyes like that, people will get suspicious. Oh. Anyway, you better take in that disgusting-looking food, Mildred. right oh, April. Come in. More paste balls for the pigeons, sir. Shall I put them on your desk with the others? Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Mildred. Right you are, sir. Now then, I hope this millet and collard oil's the right thing. It looks pretty nasty, but Victoria seems to like it. Yeah. She's about due for her midday feed, isn't she? Hello, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Here you are, dear. Nice lunch. I say, one. Do you think she's looking a little tired? Tired? Well, yes, I think. I think you may be right. Fretting a bit too, I shouldn't wonder. Perhaps she hasn't enough to occupy her mind. We could try putting Mildred's transistor radio out there with her. No, no, perhaps not. She doesn't approve of the wireless, no. Well, eat up your dinner, Victoria, and then if I were you, I'd have a nice sleep. Emergency, emergency. It's April on your intercom. I can hear Sir Gregory talking in the passage. Yes. I think he's coming in. Oh, my goodness, quick, uh, Yes. Right. Operation, whatever it is. What is it again? Yes, uh, Thank uh, you, April. Uh, Keep him out there as long as you can, will you? I'll do my best. Now, window shut. Yes, that's Notice it. Notice ball. Yes. Take that end. Right, oh, right. right. Now then, got it. On Lift. the ball. Ooh, good thing we put these hooks here. Steady, steady. Take it gently. We could do ourselves a mischief. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Covers up the whole window space. By the way, where did you find this old notice board? Behind a lot of crates in the storeroom. <laughs> Only some of those notices are a bit dated, aren't they? Oh, dear, I should have thought of that. I'll take them down and... Yes, yes, yes. Too late. Morning, Harold and Joe. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, morning there. How do you do, Sir Gregory? How do you do? Never mind about that. I want to know how you're getting on with this RAF recruiting program. We want to know how we're getting yeah, on. Yes. Oh, we're getting on very well, Sir Gregory. Thank you. Pushing ahead. I think. Oh, you? well, I've seen nothing in my office yet. Yeah, no, well, uh, to tell the truth, well, we're a that. bit held up for a slogan. Uh, yeah. Something rather punchy to start the whole thing off. Punch. Slogan, eh? Yeah. Well, I hope it's fresher than the ones on your notice board. What is all this? Don't be careless. Don't despair. Treat your stirrup pump with care. <laughs> huh? Cut your gas mask, chum. The war's been over 17 years, you know. Yes, yes, we do know. Very kind of you to remind us. Thank you. We realise that, Sir Gregory. But you never know when someone's going to start another one, do you? And if they do, Sir Gregory, we in this office are ready. With your stirrup pump? Yes. I see. What about that one? That can't look very good when the trade delegation from Munich toured the building last month. Look at it. Uh, beware, beware, German spies are everywhere. <laughs> yes, I suppose that was a bit unfortunate. There's something strange about this room today. Oh, I don't think so, Gregory. Can you notice anything strange, too? No, not at all. It seems rather dark. Dark, really? Do you find it dark, too? No, not at all. No. Rather bright, as a matter of fact. That's what I thought. Uh, could I offer you a cigarette, Sir Gregory? That is the pencil box you're holding. <laughs> oh, yes. Anyway, I don't smoke. Oh, he doesn't smoke. Very kind of you to look in, Sir Gregory. We'll let him have that RAF stuff as soon as it's done. Good. By the way, what are these disgusting-looking things on your desk? Oh, let me Little think. balls of some kind of yes. horrid paste. Yes, you're quite right. You're what quite are they? right, Sir Gregory. What are they? Uh, you tell them. Yes, well, they're little balls of some kind of horrid paste. I, <laughs> I can see that, man. I can see that. But that. what kind of paste? And for what? And for what? Uh, what for or for what? They're, 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 they're special lozenges, Sir Gregory. Yes, lozenges, yes. that's right. Lamb and I get, get sore throats. Oh, man. Yeah. Pretty yeah. nasty to me. Oh, it is. No, go ahead. Have one. Oh, don't. Yeah, not just now. No, not just now. Come along, man. Don't mind me. Have one. Don't I mind just had You did say they are lozenges. Yes, lozenges. Yes, oh, have one. Have one. Oh, very well. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. Delicious. Hamilton Joe. Oh, no, not me, thank you. Go on. Much. No, no, I don't yes. think now, I... Come on, come on, man. Do you good. Oh, my throat's better now. Go on, take one. Oh, dear, dear, dear. You want to keep you fit, you know, that RAF business is very pressing. It is very pressing, yes, Sir Greg. Well, oh, good morning, good. gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. 
Pass the waste paper basket, <laughs> quick. <laughs> oh, poor Victoria. She can't really enjoy this stuff, can she? I expect it's different for birds. Quick, now, get the notice board down and see how she is. All that business may have frightened her. Yes, it certainly frightened me, anyway. A steady one, to you. Oh, you've got it caught on. Oh, oh that's no, better. <laughs> there we Open are. Open the window. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Victoria. Are you all right? She looks a bit excited, Mum. Yes, there's something different about the way she's sitting, isn't it? Just a minute, I wonder. Two, can you see what I can see? It isn't. It can't be. <laughs> it is another, another egg. Another egg, isn't it, Marvellous? Twins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Worth putting up with all the difficulties, isn't it? Mind you, we've got double responsibility now. Tell me, Mildred, how have you been getting on with Walter, the wanton window cleaner? Well, like I told you, April, the first time I went along instead of you, he was very decent. Mm -hmm. Same on Tuesday and Thursday. We went to the pictures and he behaved like a perfect gentleman. I couldn't think what I'd done wrong. <laughs> anyway, cheered up on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. We went dancing and he began to get with it. Mm -hmm. Then Sunday we drove out to the country. Gathering rosebuds while you may. No, gathering groundsel for the pigeon. Mm -hmm. I promised Mr Lamb on Friday. Oh. He said she wasn't getting enough roughage, never leaving the nest. Never leaving the nest? You're forgetting last Wednesday, aren't you? Oh, I never forget last Wednesday. No, me. When H.J. came rushing out of the office, I thought he'd seen a ghost. Well, it was a shock, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Victoria going off and leaving the eggs like that. I hope they didn't come to any harm. Oh, I don't think so. Mind you, I'm sure we did right to cover them up. Well, I was against it at the time, because if the mother comes back and finds her eggs covered up, it scares her away. Yes. And because you said that, poor Mr. Lamb had to sit by the window all night. So the moment Victoria appeared, he could whip his bowler hat off the eggs. <laughs> I wonder where Victoria got to all Wednesday night. I wonder. Oh, well, anyway, all this worry should be over soon. According to the book, the eggs are due to hatch any day now. Well, I hope they do for Mr. Lang's sake. Yes. I've never seen anyone so worried. I suppose it's being a bachelor. There we are. That's put most of the work in order, one. I'm afraid we can't get much further until we've got this recruiting slogan. Well, keep at it, my dear fellow. Keep at it. We can't afford to relax on this. Not much in the Times this morning. The trouble is, I can't think properly. I'm so worried about Victoria. The book says these pre-hatching days are very tricky. Now then, too, we're doing all we can. But are we? I couldn't get to sleep last night for thinking about her. Sitting there all alone in the cold, I felt so guilty I couldn't even enjoy my hot drink at bedtime. <laughs> Do you think we ought to get Mildred to knit her a tiny muffler? Oh, that's a good idea. What a good idea, too. Anyway, let's have a look and see how she's getting on. Yes. You know, oh. I don't think she looks well today. She hasn't even eaten her elevenses. She's so fidgety all of a sudden, keeps making little bird-like movements of the head. What sort of movements of the head do you expect her to make, for oh. heaven's sake? Come and see for yourself. I'm sure this bird's not well. Surely can't be as bad. Oh, dear, I'm afraid you're right. She looks very peaceful. Mm. Look at her eyes, they're bloodshot. I know. Feathers coming out. Blood, I don't like the look of this at all. What are we going to do? We'll get a vet, of course. I'll ring that animal clinic across the road. Have him send one as quickly as possible. And ask April to find some smelling salts, oh, yes. would you? Oh, dear, I hope we're not too late. Here you are, Mr. Lamb, smelling salts. Ah, oh, thank you. Ah, that's better. Oh, April, I'm very worried about Victoria. Yes, of course. But H.J. rang the vet 20 minutes ago. He'll be here any moment. Where's H.J. gone? Oh, I don't know. As soon as he'd phoned the animal clinic, he dashed out looking desperate. I've been trying to get Victoria to eat, but she won't have any. Oh, I wish that vet had hurry up. Look out! Gregory's coming oh, down the Oh, my passage. goodness. Oh, dear. There's no time to put the notice board up. Quick, April, I'll shut the window. You draw the curtains. Yes, right. And I'd better stand in front of them. Yes. Now, look here about this aria of recruiting business. Hello, where's Hamilton Jones? Oh, I, I'm afraid he's out, Sir Gregory. Yes, I can see that. But wait a minute. This room's changed again. Ah, I see. You've got those curtains drawn. Why? Uh, uh, why? Yes, you said why. Well, it's uh, Mr. Hamilton Jones. He's not feeling too well today. He couldn't stand the light. Not well, Hamilton Jones? Yes, that's why he slipped out for a moment. He went over to the washroom to bathe his forehead. Extraordinary business. What's the matter? Uh, perhaps he's been overworking. You're joking, of course. Yeah, I suppose I... <laughs> 
Um, uh, excuse me, is this Mr. Emerton Jones' office? Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, good. Uh, Venables is my name. Uh, I've come from the clinic. Uh, Mr. Emerton Jones sent for me. Really? Who did you say you were? Uh, uh, yes, uh, well, he said, uh, Sir, Sir Gregory, uh, Dr. Venables is a medical man. Uh, Mr. Hamilton Jones sent for him uh, to cure this little trouble. Oh, more serious than I thought. What exactly are the symptoms? Uh, the, the symptoms, yes. Well, uh, listlessness, uh, loss of appetite, uh, nervous shaking of the head. Oh, dear, I wonder what it can be. Well, from those symptoms and the ones Mr. Emerton Jones described in the phone, I should think it's uh, bumblefoot, threadworm, or <laughs> scaly leg. What? <laughs> At worst, of course, it could be marble bone disease. Or scruffy pox. Amazing, but... But what on earth would cause a thing like that? Oh, well, these things are often caused by dirt, you know. Yes, uh, some of up here in the city don't keep themselves too clean. Goodness gracious, I can hardly believe it. Oh, well, there's not much brain there, is there, you see? You couldn't, you couldn't expect it, could you, with such a tiny little head? Uh, yes, well, thank you very much, Mr. Venables. Perhaps you'd like to wait in the outer office till we have your uh, uh, patient ready? Uh, all right, yes, uh, and I can be getting my kit out. Um, yes. I'll have to start by scrubbing the patient's feet. Scrubbing the patient's feet. Yes, yes, and then I'll give the body a good dusting over with DDT. Well, I suppose Hamilton Jones is entitled to choose his own medical uh, advisor. Mr. Venables, you are going to wait in the outer office. That's all right, it's all right. I'm off now. I've got a meeting of the supply committee. Pity. I should like to have stayed and watched the treatment. Tell Hamilton Jones I hope he feels better soon. I want that recruiting business finished. Oh, yes, uh, quite, Sir Gregory. Goodbye, Sir Gregory. Uh, and, oh, oh, I thought we'd had it that time. Me too, but there's not a moment to lose. Quick, Dr. Venables, Victoria's out there. Have you got everything you need? Uh, stethoscope? Uh, thermometer? Yes, yes, I've got everything I want, I think. Yes, thank you. Now, um, let's have a look at the patient. Yeah, well, she doesn't look too bad to me. Huh? Yes, you're right, she does look better now. Oh, but look, there's a broken eggshell. Oh? Oh, dear, that Wait means... Wait a minute. Look, can you see? It can't be. It is. One of them's hatched. They're both hatched, look. <laughs> oh, April, are they marvellous? Isn't the whole thing absolutely marvellous? It's wonderful. Well, it seems I'm in time to congratulate oh, you both. Thank you. I hope you'll all be very happy. <laughs> Hello, hello, what's going on here? It's happened, one. They've arrived, both of them. Look. Oh, bless my soul, how fascinating. Yeah, and now, now I'll surprise you, my boy. I had a premonition this was on the way. Hmm? That's why I slipped out of the shops. April, go and fetch <laughs> Mildred, will you? I've got a little something here to mark the occasion. You haven't, one. How splendid. A bottle of Peruvian port-type sherry. You'll join us in a glass, Mr... Oh, Venables. Uh, yes, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I should remind you, your worries aren't quite over yet. These squabs won't fly for a fortnight or more, so you'll have to look after them as well as the mother. Now then, I'm quite sure that's a boy and that's a girl. In fact, I'll put half a crown on it. No, no thanks, Martin. I won't argue with you this time. I mean, it stands to reason that one's a female. She never stops opening her beak. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting on a bit quicker than Albert, isn't she? Yeah, well, they're both doing pretty well, I'd say. Be flying any day now, you mark my words. <laughs> All right, Victoria, we haven't forgotten you. Have a paste ball. Excuse me, sir. This memo's just arrived from establishment officer. Oh, dear, is it important? I rather think it is. Let me see. Thank you. During the next few days, workmen will be redecorating the front of the building. This work will be done from the outside... But staff are asked to accept a certain amount of noise and inconvenience. I say, what a good idea. About time this place was done up. Yes, but I hope they don't make all the windows stick like they did last time. Don't you see? Scaffolding, workmen. What's going to happen to the birds? The birds? Oh, oh, my dear. goodness. You're quite right, April. Of course, it'll be pandemonium. Well, the nest will be destroyed the first day. Or at least Victoria will be scared off and the babies will die. Why, well, we've got to stop them. But how? Could we say it'd interrupt our work? No, that's not a subject I want to raise, Mr. Gregory, at the moment, if you don't mind. <laughs> don't forget his ultimatum on the recruiting campaign. How about all sitting in the road? Stop the lorries bringing the scaffolding. Well, I know it's a hobby of yours, Mildred, but I don't think the minister would appreciate it. <laughs> got to do something. Wait a minute, I got an idea. April, get Scotland Yard on the phone, would you? Yes. Ask for the traffic director. Oh, I... oh, don't say it's me, say it's, uh, mm, let me think, the Duke of Bridlington. Yes, yes, Duke of Bridlington. <laughs> From the Office of State Occasions. All right. Yes. I'll do it in the outer office. Yes. Put in that's it. That's it. Good. The Duke of Bridlington? <laughs> There's <laughs> no such person, is there? What's all this about? You know, Mildred's quite right. 
If we stop their lorries, they can't put up their scaffolding. Yes, but we can't sit in the road. It wouldn't be... I mean, it's, uh, it'll be cold and wet. Oh, my dear fellow, put yourself together. There's more than one way. Ah, oh, that'll be my call. Hello? Is that the uh, traffic director, Scotland Yard? Yes, speaking. Oh, and that's the uh, Duke of Bridlington, is it? Is it? Oh, yes, it is. Yes, quite right. Yes, quite right. Yes. Quite right. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Oh, fine. Fine, thank you, sir. Busy as always. And how are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Just wanted to check the arrangements for tomorrow's state visit of the Sultan of Uwait. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was that again, sir? Oh, come, 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 man. The Sultan of you wait, I said. You know about his state visit, don't you? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, only I can't quite put my finger on the details at the moment. Well, you better get your finger moving quickly. He arrives first thing tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow? Uh, oh, I mean, yes, yes, that's right. Uh, I remember. Yes, and of course, you know, he plans to visit Parliament. Haven't forgotten that, have you? So he'll be oh. driving down Whitehall sometime tomorrow or the next day. With the Sultana, of course. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I have the papers in front of me now. Oh, good boy. I mean, well, I mean, thank you, yes. Have you, really? Yes. Well, now then. Uh, no doubt you're having Whitehall closed to all vehicles from first thing tomorrow morning till further notice, aren't you? Oh, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. I, I, uh, that's exactly what we're going to do, sir. That's right. <laughs> Uh, till further notice, did you say? That's right, yes. Oh, well, I should have thought... Uh, I mean, we thought uh, perhaps just till Friday would cover it, sir. Friday? Oh, well, very well. They should have flown away by then. Flown away? Yes, flown back to you, wait. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your cooperation. No, not at all, sir. All part of the job. Goodbye. I didn't think I'd better press my luck too hard, so it gives Victoria and Albert two days. Two days? I hope they can learn to fly in that time. Perhaps if we all stand in front of the window and flap our arms, they might get the idea. <laughs> now, Albert, you must try. Look, like this, you see? <laughs> <laughs> now, it's no use to you. You've been jumping off that desk for two days, and I don't think Albert's... A... <laughs> Albert's not the slightest bit interested. But doesn't he realise it's Friday? Look, they're already assembling the scaffolding down there. Well, nobody can say we didn't try. No one could possibly say we didn't try. Traffic halted, questions in the House, vote of censure on the government. Can't mean many birds get that sort of treatment. I hope there aren't any repercussions, one. I expect there are a few red faces somewhere. I notice they chose the middle of the night for removing the no-entry signs. I mean, I hope they never find out we're responsible. We're in enough trouble already with this recruiting programme. Sir Gregory says if it's not done by midday, there'll be an official complaint. And we still haven't found our slogan. Well, don't worry. If you haven't found it by 11.30, I'll start thinking about it. And then look at this pigeon. He's got all his feathers, his sister's flown off, his mother's flown off, but poor Albert's still sitting there waiting for the workman to sweep him up. In two minutes, it'll be too late. Yes, look, Sir Gregory's down there giving the men their instructions. Wait a minute, look. Albert's moving. My goodness, you're right, he's struggling out of the nest. I think... Yes, he is. He's taking oh, off. Oh, oh, wonderful. Bravo, Albert. Wait a minute, now. <laughs> uh, oh, I hope he doesn't... I hope he isn't going to... Albert, don't! Too late, I'm afraid he has. <laughs> Maybe Sir Gregory will move. He didn't. <laughs> Albert, you are a little rascal. Oh, oh, look at that, Sir Gregory's furious. Look, he's shaking his fist. <laughs> Albert doesn't mind. He's flying up to the roof over there. Wouldn't his father be proud of him? A real chip off the old block, you know. Look at him up there, pleased as punch. Yes, and you know one? I think I've got that RAF slogan we wanted. How about... On a winged career embark, learn to fly and make your mark. Excellent. <laughs> Muddling through as the men from the ministry were Wilfred Hyde-White and Richard Murdoch. Other essential personnel were Diana Olson, Norma Ronald, Roy Dutrice, Percy Edwards and John Graham. The Men from the Ministry is written and produced by Edward Taylor.
time to meet the men from the ministry. We present Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch as the men from the ministry, a weekly tribute to those who sail our ship of state through the hazards of modern life and guide it surely and squarely right up the creek. Civil servants are typically British people, and if we peep into any Whitehall office, for instance that of the General Assistance Department, we find a typically British scene. Pardon, monsieur, avez-vous le correct time? Uh, je ne suis pas tout sure, but... Uh... Oh, it's no use, but I'll never get the hang of this. Don't worry, my dear fellow, most of these French chaps speak English, you know. Anyway, the better sort do. Only the British diplomat abroad should just try and appear interested. Mm, thank goodness this Paris conference will have English as the official language. Well, so I should hope. These foreigners have got some sense of decency, you know. Away from the conference, of course, you can use this little book. It gives suitable phrases for every single... Situation. Ah, does it? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, here. In the hotel, I asked for a room overlooking the city square, the public park, the ornamental gardens, the distant hills, the statue of Queen Victoria. Quite right, too. An Englishman must have proper quarters. Mm. You have given me a room overlooking the refuse dump, the railway sheds, the knacker's yard, the cemetery, the prison... The septic tank. <laughs> you haven't much idea of town planning, you know. Anyway, it's a bakshi trip to Paris. Think of it. French food, that wonderful squidgy cheese with the soft skin. What's it called now? And the nightclubs with all those gorgeous showgirls. Come on, bear. Yes, I believe they do. <laughs> the elegant strollers on the Champs Elysees. Come in. Please, sir, the Paris bookings have come through. Good. Everything in order? Well, it seems Paris is very full, what with the conference and that. But you've got the last two rooms at the Hotel Les Miserables. <laughs> that doesn't sound very jolly. One room's on the first floor with balcony and fire escape. The other's on the fifth and there's no lift. Um, the hotel wants to know who's going to have which. Well, perhaps we'd better toss for it. Oh, no need for that. I don't mind roughing it on the first floor. <laughs> you can go up on the fifth. The air's purer. Hmm. I'll tell them, Mr. Hamilton Jones. It seems where all systems go, then. Yes, except I would like to know a bit more about the actual conference. All I know is we're representing Britain at the Services, Cultural, Intellectual and Athletic Training International Coordinating Association. That's it, abbreviated, of course, to S-C-I-A-T-I-C-A. Hmm, sciatica. Yes. <laughs> Now, Sadler exists to improve mutual understanding between the various Allied armies in NATO, in particular by means of a big sports contest. But we all have different sports, don't we? Yes, 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 yes. I know all about that. Now, to achieve peaceful cooperation, all countries have got to make sacrifices. The NATO armies must swallow national pride, give up their traditional sports, and learn an international game. I suppose you're right. Still, it does seem a shame for the British to give up cricket. Don't be a damn fool. Of course we shan't give up cricket. That's the game all the foreigners will have to learn. Oh, that is a relief. You gave me a nasty turn for a moment. My dear chap, that, as I see it, is the whole purpose of our mission to Paris, isn't it? We've got to persuade all these foreign nobles to take up cricket. How marvellous that would be for world peace. Now, I'm off to do a bit of last-minute shopping, packet of tea, some good strong soap and plenty of disinfectant. You can bring the teapot. See you on the boat train. Yeah, well, all right. Cheer up. Oh, how you're going to keep them down in Whitehall after they've seen Clary. Uh, had, uh, oh, um, Mildred. Cool, you went off lucky, Mr. Lamb, getting this trip to Paris. Mum went there once. She says some Frenchman crept up behind and pinched her in the Tuileries. <laughs> That'll do, Mildred. Now, remember, with us away and Miss Adams on leave, you'll be in charge of all ministry business. Yes. Are you quite clear about the important matters? Oh, yes, Mr. Lamb. I have to watch the pigeon's eggs on the windowsill, mm -hmm. water Mr. H.J.'s trade of scantier, and stamp permission refused on all correspondence. <laughs> Good. We're all set, then. Oh, there's just this long canvas cricket bag Mr. H.J. ordered from Harridge's for you to take with you. Oh, the cricket bag, yes. Ooh. Now, let's have a look at it. Uh, stumps, pads, bats. My word, we'll put the Continentals in their place with this lot. This could be England's answer to the Norman Conquest. <laughs> Nadia, I have important news. 
What is it, Otto? You know that for months we have been expecting a big change in the Western defense system. That's right. Yeah. Some kind of secret weapon. Well, our agent in Whitehall has learned of a secret conference in Paris. Code name Skyatica. Our agent cannot find out the purpose of this conference, but to me it is obvious. Obviously, you think it is about NATO's secret weapon. Yeah, a, a, a new bomb, perhaps a missile, a rocket. We must find out. What's the plan, then? Two great defense experts from England will to the conference go. One of them has with him a large canvas bag, a long one. <laughs> we believe that in this bag is the secret weapon. Two men, eh? I suppose that's where little me comes in. Correct. On the boat, you will the acquaintance of each make. You will find out the truth. Darling, it'll be a pleasure. <laughs> Just pass me that perfume, will you? That's the one. Cleopatra's sin. <laughs> I'm glad we decided to come by boat. There's a nautical tradition in my family. Is there really? Mm, all this pitching and tossing doesn't worry me a bit. Oh, of course. You know, you may feel different once we get outside the harbour. <laughs> I doubt it. I've taken six pills. Now, listen to me, too. I can't overemphasize the importance of security on this mission. If any hostile power discovered our NATO cricket bands, they'd go all out to wreck them. So hang on to that cricket bag and keep it fastened, won't yes, you? Yes, and we mustn't even mention the conference to anyone. Quite, right, quite, right. We don't want to ask we're off on holiday. Now, I'm going below before we reach the open sea. Oh, is that wise? You'll feel much better on deck with me. You know, drink in the fresh air, drink in the sea and the sky. No, thanks. I'm going to drink in the bar. <laughs> See you at Calais. Right, Al. How unhealthy. I'll just put this seat by the lifeboat and study my freeze book. Excuse me. Yeah. Do you mind if I put my seat next to yours? Well, actually, I'm rather afraid that... Oh, <laughs> of course. Uh, I, I mean, uh, no. no. Only I do rather need someone to talk to. You see, it's my first time crossing, and you look so confident and strong. Oh, well, I do play quite a lot of ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> you say this is your first channel crossing? Yes, that's right. I'm afraid I've led rather a sheltered life. You know, teaching maths and looking after mummy. <laughs> Well, don't worry, I'm quite used to this sort of thing. Oh, how brave of you. <laughs> I expect you're going over to France on holiday. No, actually, I... I mean, yes. I mean, well, just between you and me, I'm official British representative at a big NATO conference. Oh, how thrilling. <laughs> What's it all about? Well, actually, it's all to do with... Uh... <laughs> I, I beg your pardon. Actually, no, no, I... Uh... I can't tell you, I'm afraid. It's terribly hush-hush. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> I'll tell you how to avoid seasickness. Oh, no. The main thing is to stay on deck and watch the sea. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to have something to do. So if we sit here and study my phrase book, you'll be as right as rain. Oh. And if you do feel groggy, you can hold my hand. Oh. I shan't mind. <laughs> You're quite right, darling. We've been at sea a whole hour, and I feel absolutely splendid. Oh, 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 I wish I were dead. Oh, darling, if you hang any further over the side, you'll fall in the water. Oh. You were going to tell me all about that fascinating conference in Paris. You know, I don't know if it's a good time to bring it up. But... <laughs> I must go downstairs and lie in my bedroom. <laughs> well, all right, all right. I'll look after your canvas bag for you. Yeah, no, 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 I'll take that. Oh. Oh, so much for that one. Well, Nadia, what have you found out? Only what we know already. When I tried to find out more, he put up a brilliant pretense of being uh, a fool. As I thought, one of their top agents. Yes, now you show we should go through with this. Of course. We have buttered our bread and now we must lie on it. <laughs> go and try the other one. He is in the bar. Thank goodness for that. One more gasp of this fresh air and I'd have suffocated. Won't they tell each other about me? No, no, of course not. With Englishmen, a beautiful girl is like a place to park his car. If he finds one, he keeps it to himself. <laughs> Another brandy, please, Stuart. Large one again, sir? Yes, please. I'll tell you what. This time, just give me the bottle. I'll pour it myself. Thank you. <laughs> now, as you just pass the soda, there. 
Now, will you give me a bill that I can take home to show for expenses, please? Excuse me. I beg your pardon, what's that? Who? Oh, oh. Oh, have you got the time? Oh, yes, any amount. I mean, the time. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. One fifteen. Oh, one fifteen. Oh, thank goodness. Not long before we reach Calais. Aren't you enjoying the trip? Well, it's my first crossing, you see, and I'm rather nervous. Dear me, dear me, sit down, my dear. Nothing to worry about. Steward a brandy for the lady. <laughs> oh, my dear, you are kind. You seem the sort of man that a girl could lean on. Lean on? Oh, am I? How nice. Oh, yeah, well, not in public. Oh, yeah, perhaps a little late. <laughs> I mean, one feels you're confident and experienced. Do you? Does one? Am I? That's yes. nice. <laughs> yes, I'll bet while all these other people are just off on holiday, you are going across to do some frightfully important job. Oh, gracious, how funny you should say that. I'm right, I'm right. I'm well, right. yes, only it's terribly secret. Actually, I'm representing Britain at a very important conference in Paris. Oh, how marvellous. What's it all about? Well, basically, the plan is... Uh, your brandy, madam... Soda or water? Soda, please. Uh, do go on. No, actually, I can't. I know I can trust you, of course, but mm. walls have ears, don't they? Oh, this brand is good. Keeps away the seasickness, doesn't yes, it? Yes, but listen, this new project... My assistant stayed up on deck, rather fancies himself as a sailor. Ten minutes ago, he staggered through here looking like the death of Nelson. Oh, dear. Ridiculous <laughs> getting ill on a cross, isn't it? Ridiculous, what? Yes. yes. Brand is the thing. Mind you, five or six of these large ones does make you a bit dizzy. Well, listen, you were telling me about the conference, I didn't darling. think I'd had as many as that, actually. Perhaps it was the gins <laughs> in between. You haven't got two heads, have you? <laughs> Stanley, darling, are you all right? Oh, yes, yes. I just don't feel very comfortable on this sorbo rubber furniture, that's all. I think I'd better go and lie down a minute. You will excuse me, won't you? Oh, dear, I think I'll have to hurry. It's incredible he's as cunning as the other one. <laughs> In this magnificent conference palace, we must pledge ourselves to agreement. All must make sacrifices in order that democracy may flourish. I say, wake up, one. I, I think he's finishing. What's that? What? What's he been on about? He's been on about two hours. Uh, look out, I think you're next to speak. Oh. We in Italy feel that we must all go forward together. The time has surely come when we must cycle forward together, arm in arm, into the glorious future which lies behind the horizon. Thank you. Uh, merci. I now call on the representative of Great Britain. Thank you. That's you yes, that's me. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. yes, I will. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, it is with much pleasure that I rise to address you on this vital subject of a mutual sport for the Allied armies. We in Great Britain say this. We must all go forward together. We maintain that international cooperation is more important than national pride. And furthermore... We... And that is why we feel that cricket is the one game which can unite our allied troops in a spirit of mutual misunderstanding. <laughs> I say to you, play up, play up, and play the game. Yes. Now, just to help put you in the picture, gentlemen, I'm going to show you some cricket kit. Uh, just hand me the things out of the bag, would you, please, uh, too? Yes, I'd like to hit it. A bat? Thank you. Now, this, you see, is a bat used for hitting the ball. Ball. Ah, yes, now, this is the ball. Little red chap, you see. <laughs> now, the bowler uses this to try and hit the stumps. Uh, uh, stumps. Uh -huh. uh, stumps. These are the stumps. Normally, they're hammered into the ground, but we don't want to wreck the floor of the conference palace, do we? <laughs> Perhaps we just lean them against the wall over there. What do you think? You chap from Germany, would you mind? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Here is all right. Oh, top hole. Now, the batsman stands in front of the stumps and tries to score runs, you see. Bit difficult to explain, so perhaps we could just demonstrate. What do you think about that? Uh, two, take the bat and stand over there, would you? Yeah, I'll yeah, give you a couple of slow left armors. No, no, wait a minute. The table's in the way. Mr. Chairman, fellow delegates, I wonder if you'd mind getting up a minute. That's it. Good. Oh, thank you, thank you. To move the table over against the wall. Do you, do you mind standing a moment, do you, gentlemen? No, don't be silly. Don't all stand on the same side. Let's have the Benelux group feeling on the leg side. <laughs> over there. That's right, yes. Ah, oh, Monsieur Closhmel at mid-arm. Yes, yes. Thank you, Monsieur Closhmel. Now, I just take a short run. Arm comes over, not bent, you see. There. <laughs> Oh, well done, too. Yes, let's try again. Now, on your toes, you fielders. One, two, three. There. Oh, dear.
Monsieur, you should have caught that, you know, you chap from Italy. Must keep your eye on the ball. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. Oh, never mind, never mind. Let's have another shot. Excuse, please, could I uh, go meet the ball have? Oh, of course, my dear chap. Oh, 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 oh. How nicely you put it, yes. I'll take the bat, too. You should have been out that time anyway. Oh, nonsense, money. It was a bum ball. Now, come along. You want your expense sheet signed when you get home, don't you? Oh, very well. Here you are. Right. But I wasn't out. Ready when you are, bowler. Ah, uh, good. Eins, zwei, drei. Over mit the arm. So. Oh, 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 nice oh, 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 steady one. It's gone right out through the open window. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Entre. Excuse me, Monsieur le Président, but please, could we have our ball back? <laughs> So, Felix couldn't get into the conference. We still don't know what it's about. We know it must be a secret weapon, mm. as we suspected. One hour ago, an unidentified missile shattered the president's window <laughs> from the direction of the conference. We must find out the nature of this English weapon. But those two English agents are so shrewd. They make James Bond look like old Mother Hubbard. <laughs> well, I still have a few tricks up my shirt. Felix is waiting. He is waiting, Felix is, outside the conference to kidnap them in his taxi. If this fails, he will return and snatch the secret weapon back. Well, I think that went off rather well, one. They all seemed to take to the game, didn't they? Yes, indeed, they did. That Belgian delegate's working up rather smart Google, didn't mm. you think? <laughs> Do you think you did right to declare? Oh, of course, sure of it. The conference is due to adjourn at 4.30. Anyway, now we can get the other side in first thing in the morning before the shrine's gone off the floor. <laughs> also, it does give us a couple of hours to see Paris before dinner. <laughs> Let's call a taxi and have a trip round. <laughs> taxi, monsieur? Why, well, that was quick. Don't you think it's rather a pleasant afternoon for walking, too? I've got my street map here. Oh, all right. Uh, no thanks, taxi driver. Some other time, perhaps. <laughs> Well, I never realised that sign was international. <laughs> I say, well, you're looking rather worried. What is it? Yes, well, you know, about this stage any trip away from home, I begin to wonder what I should take back for my wife as a present. She expects one, you know. Oh. I did promise I'd get her a model gown from one of the new Paris collections. What a splendid plan. On the other hand, it's awfully hard to choose something when she isn't here to try it on, isn't yes, it? Yes, well, what about some jewellery? Rather well, fancy one might get into trouble with the customs over jewellery. I suppose I could take her some champagne. That's a good idea. There isn't really room in my suitcase. Oh, uh, handkerchiefs? Well, no, got too many of those already. On the whole, I think I'll give her one of those small stainless steel models of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> she could put it on the mantelpiece, couldn't she? Oh, that will be a surprise for her. You might try one of those street vendors. What's that chap selling? Looks like postcards to me. How interesting. Local views, I expect. Mm. May I see one of the... Oh, good gracious. <laughs> what is it, one? Look at this picture. Oh, dear. I haven't seen anything like that mm. since the drama club's Christmas social. Take them away, take them away, take them away immediately. Oh, no, I think this fellow looks as if he's going to speak to us. Excuse me, monsieur, but uh, have you please a light? Oh, yes, of course. Here you are. Oh, 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 ah, look out, look out, he's got the back. Stop him, stop him. He took me by surprise. Oh, dear, there's never a gendarme when you want one. Now, out of the way, too, out of the way. Stop. Lucky I've got a spare cricket ball in my pocket. I think fast, full toss. What do you think? Oh. Got him right behind the ear. Well <laughs> done, man. I'm afraid it was more of a rounder's throw, really. They say Paris is full of these footpads. Better get the bag before his cronies turn up. And we must find a place that sells small stainless steel models of the Eiffel Tower. Amazing. Felix cannot describe what knocked him out. Some kind of deadly anti-personnel weapon. <laughs> So we still have neither the bag nor the secret. Now, no, it is up to you, Nadia. A good thing you have this room in the hotel. Tonight you invite upstairs the leader. The usual routine. Champagne and encouragement. Yes. At 12 o'clock, I burst in to find him ensnared. I am the outraged husband. So, I found you alone with my wife. Yes, yes, darling, don't get so excited. What you mean is we blackmail him into giving us the secret. And if that will not work, then we use the last resort. But let us hope not. Violence is messy. Now, the Englishman we want 
is in 118 on the fifth floor. Call the boy and send up a note at once. Are you quite sure you want to change rooms, Worm? Honestly, I'm quite happy up here on the fifth Not floor. Not at all, my dear fellow. As I lay awake in my first floor room last night, I realized how selfish I'd be. Poor old two, I thought. Right out of things up there on the top floor. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better take my things down to your old room, That's then. That's right. Then we're all set for an evening out. Ah, front stalls at the Follies. Dinner at the Moulin Rouge, I think, don't yes. you? I hope they accept luncheon vouchers. <laughs> I wonder whether we should try these French specialities. A friend of mine had frog's legs, and they made him rather jumpy. Oh, <laughs> oh well, shall be on. I do hope Penelope likes this model of the Eiffel Tower. Looks good on this table, anyway. Entree! A letter for you, monsieur. For me? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, carry on. No need to wait. Uh, the service, monsieur. Oh, the tip, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Well, here you are. Monsieur? Haven't you seen one of those before? It's no. a very valuable English coin, my boy. <laughs> Twelve sides, you see. Think of the craftsmanship in that. <laughs> Merci, monsieur. Now, what's the envelope say? To the handsome Englishman in 118. Oh, it is for me. <laughs> what's this? Delighted to find we are in the same hotel. My room is 57. Come and share a bottle of champagne at 10 o'clock from the girl on the boat. The girl. Good gracious me. What a coincidence. Oh, oh, oh. I'd better get some flowers. Uh, excuse me, one. I left my aftershave on the dressing table. Must smell our best for the night out. Oh, the night out, yes. That reminds me. I mean, you know, I've suddenly got an awful headache. Uh, I don't think I'd better come after all. Not come? After all our plans? Yes, it is a bit, isn't it? I'm terribly sorry. Never mind, you go. I'll just take things quietly here and, um... Get a little piece. I get a little piece. I beg your pardon, what's that? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, now, I'll just pop out and get some aspirins. You carry on, and I do hope you have a jolly good time. Well, funny. <laughs> that headache came on very quickly. I suppose it's... Oh, I wonder who that could be. Hello? I mean, uh, bonjour. Hello, darling. It's me. You? Who? And you who to you too, darling. <laughs> it's me, the girl on the boat. Didn't you get my note? The girl on the... How splendid. But I didn't get any note. Well, I, I thought that boy didn't look very bright. That's why I decided I'd better ring and check. I'm staying in the hotel, darling. I was hoping you'd come to my room. It come to... Oh, yes, of course. At once. I'll come now if you've got nothing on. I mean, <laughs> I've got nothing on, and if you're the same... Let's then... say... Uh, <laughs> just let's say ten o'clock, shall we? Give the champagne time to chill. <laughs> room 57. See you later. <laughs> Room 57, 10 o'clock. Oh, this is exciting. I must pop out and get some flowers. <laughs> ah, here you are, darling. Come in. I'm sorry I'm late. I brought you these orchids. Oh, how divine. It's so lovely to see you. We didn't finish our talk on the boat, did we? <laughs> Come and sit down. Or could you be awfully strong and open the champagne? Well, I'll try. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> can I can I sit here next to you? You know, I feel the uh, old friend. Oh, rather, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Do you like this dress, darling? Oh yes, mind you, it's a bit, uh, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can see. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, darling. I can see it came from a very expensive shop. <laughs> I'm so, so, so glad you like it. <laughs> now, drink up the bubbly and tell me all about yourself. And so that is how I became a school prefect. <laughs> And then when I left, father told me to have a shot at the civil service. How simply fascinating. <laughs> have some more champagne. No, no, I, I don't know. Well, perhaps one teeny weeny little bottle. <laughs> I shouldn't really. Oh, know. but I... darling, darling. Paris is the place for wine, women and song. Yes. I can't say I'm bothered about the singing part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you... Naughty, no. naughty man. No. All right. All right. Oh, dear. There's someone at the door. But it's not midnight yet. I mean... 
don't move, darling. I'd better go and see. Oh, I say, how embarrassing. And me with one shoe off. <laughs> So sorry, I'm late. I've, I brought you a few roses. Oh, <laughs> how lovely. Oh, 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 not as lovely as you, my dear. Mm. What's the beauty of flowers beside the beauty of a woman's... Good gracious, too. <laughs> oh, uh, hello, Ron. Did we ever get that memo off to the men of Ag and Fitch? <laughs> <laughs> Twelve o'clock. <laughs> After two hours alone with Nadia, even an Englishman should be warmed up. Well, now he will have a surprise. In with the key, quick, and... So, I find you alone with my wife. Both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good hit, Nadia. Well held, too. Sorry, my damn fridge, you're out. Hello, who's this? Who's this? Who's this? So this is Otto, my husband. So I find you in a compromising position. There's nothing very compromising about a three-handed game of cricket. <laughs> French cricket, too, appropriately enough. Still, now you're here, we can have a proper game. Uh, so you wish to play games? I can play games. I have in my hand a knife. Good, I'll borrow it if I may. Can't keep the score with a blunt pencil. <laughs> right, you field over there by the window, whatever your name is. Otto, is it? That's right, over by the window. Are you sure you're quite comfortable, Mr Lamb? As comfortable as you can be, lying on your front in a hospital bed. Poor you. And you mean to say you played cricket with those spies all night? Yes, and then about eight o'clock in the morning, they both broke down, burst into tears and confessed they'd been out to steal our secrets. Reforming influence of cricket, you see. They were quite overcome, said they'd pack up spying and retire. Well, did you ever? And everything went all right at the sciatica conference? Indeed it did. All the Allies are taking up cricket. That reminds me, we better be off. The MCC are meeting at Lord's and I've got to propose those two new members, Adana and a goal. <laughs> Chin up, too. The doctor says you'll be out in a week. Goodbye, Mr Lamb. Goodbye, Mildred. Goodbye, Juan. Nurse, switch on the earphones, will you? It's the test match. This way out, uh, Mildred. Right you are, sir. What I can't understand is, if everything went so well in Paris and you dealt with those spies without any violence, why is Mr. Lamb in hospital? Well, um, actually, Mildred, the accident happened the day we got back. Mm -hmm. Halfway through his unpacking, Mr. Lamb realized that a lot of things in his case were mine due to the mix-up with the rooms, you see. Mm -hmm. So he stopped and sat down to consider the matter. Unfortunately, he'd already placed on the chair a small stainless steel model of the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. In that program, Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch were bewitched by Betty Marsden as Nadia, bothered by Norma Ronald as Mildred, and bewildered by Roy Detrice and David Graham as a variety of wily foreigners. The Men from the Ministry is written and produced by Edward Taylor. present Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch in The Men from the Ministry, a weekly tribute to those who work in our government departments. These are dedicated men for the jobs they do are varied and pressing, and the offices they work in are very depressing too. From Big Ben to Nelson's Column stretches the most famous street in London, Whitehall. Here is the nerve centre of the country, where an army of public servants works unceasingly, here are the men whose decisions affect the lives of millions. Here is the brain of Britain. They hadn't got any currant buns, so I had to bring Eccles cakes. <laughs> Put them in the filing cabinet till eleven says, would you, Miss Adams? They won't have long to wait, will they? Oh, my late again. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I had an accident. I caught my umbrella in my bicycle chain and <laughs> stopped all the traffic on Lambeth Bridge. Oh, why don't you try getting up earlier? I bet you don't have any breakfast as it is. Oh, I have a cup of tea and a good cough. 
but you're right, though. I do need a woman to look after me. Someone like you, Miss Adams. Now, we've had all that out before. Honestly, Miss Adams. April, marry me, Miss Adams, and if we get it done quick, we'll save a year's income tax. <laughs> Mr. Lamb, please. Oh, please. Honestly, April, no, I... Oh, no. oh, Mildred, why don't you knock before you come in? I'm sorry, Mr. Lamb. I didn't realise you'd be at it so early. <laughs> That'll do, Mildred. And I was not at it, as you put it. Unfortunately. <laughs> anyway, you should be getting on with your work. Where's the post? There isn't any. No post? Then you'd better write some quick or they'll make us redundant. Well, I mean, there is some post, but you can't have it because I haven't dated it yet. Well, then stop painting your nails and date it. I can't date the post because the date stamp's gone. It's vanished. But if we can't have the post till you find the date stamp, the whole department's at a standstill. Mr. Hamilton Jones will be here any minute, and what am I going to tell him? You'll have to tell him you've lost the date stamp. But I haven't. Look, you're in charge next to number one. It's my job to stamp the post when I've got a stamp to stamp with. It's your job to provide the stamp. Oh, this is terrible. The Cold War, the economic crisis, and now we've lost the date stamp. <laughs> H.J.'s going to be furious. Watch out, here he is. Oops. Yes, here he is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning, ma'am. Bring the post into my office, would you, too? Go on, tell him. Uh, uh, there's just one thing, ma'am. What's that? Uh, did you have a simply splendid weekend? Oh, very pleasant, thank you very much. Spot of shooting with Lord Carraway, dinner with the Duke of Dorset. Very quiet, you know. Bring in the post, there's a good fellow. Yeah, yeah. Well, go on in, then. All right, don't rush me. Look, it's only a lost date stamp. H.J. can't do any worse than have you transferred, now can he? Have you transferred? To records at Inverglocky. Records at Inverglocky? <laughs> but that's in the Outer Hebrides. It's where all the civil servants go when they drop a clangor. <laughs> Bernard said so. And who's Bernard? My boyfriend in Ag and Fish. He says it's a horrid place in the Glocky, just rocks and seagulls and a north wind freezing you to the marrow. Bernard says it's worse than Devil's Island. Don't be ridiculous. One wouldn't send me to a place like that just because we've lost the day stamp. Will he? I say, too, do you know the Western Isles of Scotland at all? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, not yet. Pity. Stuck on a crossword clue. Uh. Never mind. I'll get my shaky ring up the Scottish office. By the way, here's the date stamp. I borrowed it yesterday. Oh, the date stamp. <laughs> uh, you were changing the rubber roller. What? No, I was changing the date of my library book. Now, come along. <laughs> come along into my office, my dear chap, and don't fiddle-faddle. I never fiddle-faddle. Well, it's not good enough, you know. Eleven o'clock already. We haven't started. I'm terribly sorry, one. You see, my bicycle chain... I don't want to hear about your bicycle chain. There's no time to waste. Here are the golf clubs and here are the balls. We'll have three shots each chipping into my waste paper bin. <laughs> Threepence around as usual, yeah, eh? But, well, I've got heat to do this morning. There's a memo in triplicate from admin asking why memos are being sent out in triplicate. <laughs> then there's the meteorological office wanting to borrow our barometer. Not to mention that, yeah, well, Never mind, never mind, never mind about that. I'll have the first shot, shall I? Oh, all right. <laughs> oh, oh, good, good. Oh, dear, oh, dear, see you. That isn't out of my mouth, will you? Oh, all right. General Assistance Department. Permanent Undersecretary for Mr. Hamilton Jones. Oh, uh, uh, I'm afraid he's in conference at the moment. Uh, can it come out? Uh, yes, Sir Gregory. Who is it? Uh, Sir Gregory Pitkin. Oh, what a nuisance. All right, give it to me. Hello, Sir Gregory. Nice to hear from you. How are the petunias coming along? Well, have you read it? Have I read it? Sent it over last night. What? Don't tell me you haven't looked at your mail at half past eleven in the morning. Oh, no, I wouldn't tell you that, Sir Gregory. Uh, quick, too, the mail. It's all right, hang on. Yes. Uh, well, I dealt with it so long ago, Sir Gregory, I've forgotten all about it, you see. How are the hollyhocks, Sir Gregory? Memo from Sir Gregory. And the hollyhocks. What? what do you think of the memo? Oh, yes, what do I think of the memo? Yeah, yeah. Very neatly done, Sir Gregory. <laughs> Wish I had your secretary. Now stop beating about the bush, man. Did you find it yet? What? Circular from the Christmas club. Yeah. Office out. Hello? 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 I can't keep this up much longer. <laughs> this is a very bad line, Sir Gregory. Then think of a better one. Oh. <laughs> ah, this must be it. Isle of Wight Purchase Project. You'll have what? Isle of Wight Purchase Project. Oh, you too. I see. Thank you very much. Yes, Sir Gregory, yes. Uh, it seems the war office wanted us to buy a small piece of land on the Isle of Wight for army training. Yes, I, I know all that. Don't read me own flaming memo back to me. I want to know how you're tackling it. Well, we're tackling it. Yes, quite right. I'm glad you said so. Listen, we're leaving no turn unstuck. Well, no tackle. Now, look, this is top secret. Top priority job. Oh, top 
War office need this corner of the Isle of Wight. Top job. But they can't show their hand for security reasons. Oh. That's why you've got to make the purchase. Where? Oh, Be discreet yeah. now. Avoid compulsory purchase at all costs. We don't want publicity. Oh, no, of course not. We don't worry, don't worry. I'll handle this myself and my kindest regards to Lady Pip. Dear me, something scatters all. Two, the war office wants us by some bit of land. It's all in that wretched memo. See to it, will you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm going off to my club now. Uh, your club? Which one? The Athenaeum or the Venus Strip? <laughs> Two, I may tell you I'm meeting the Undersecretary for Cultural Affairs. Oh, then it'll be the Venus Strip. <laughs> Bring me back the programme, won't you? And don't worry about the Isle of Wight business. I'll give it my full personal attention. Good man. April, there's a beastly memo here about some land in the Isle of Wight. Do something about it, will you? Ah, there you are, Mr. Lamb. I've got all the information on this bit of the Isle of Wight the War Office wants. Thank you, April. Oh, you are a treasure. You really are. Uh, I'll take it into H.J. if he's back from lunch. It's four o'clock. Well, you never know. He may be early. <laughs> Ah, there you are, one. Uh, did you have a good lunch? Be quiet. Shh, shh. Oh. Oh, 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 pretty good one, pretty good, yes, yes. Did I have a good What were you talking about? Uh, did you have a good lunch? Oh, yes, excellent, excellent, thank you. And you? Uh, well, I didn't have much time to eat. I've been ferreting out all this stuff on the Isle of Wight. Yes. Now, here's a large-scale map and a list of the details. You can see the area in question in this remote corner of the island here. Yes, nice spot. We'd ask a good price for it. But we're not selling it, we're buying it. Oh, I see, I beg your pardon. Well, we needn't offer much for a dingy place like that, need we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, I missed it that time. I Listen, we'll have another, uh, go. Yeah, we'll have another go. Yeah. Looks better if we get it. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you very much. Now then, who does this place belong to? There are two estates in the area that the army want. One is owned by a retired admiral called Monkley, uh -huh. and the other by a Miss Amelia Chambers. Oh. Apparently, she runs hers as a bird sanctuary. She breeds puffins. Good gracious me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what exactly is a puffin? It's a gloomy sort of bird with round eyes and a big fat beak. Oh, oh, oh. a bit like old Phipps over the border train. <laughs> old Phipps, that's rather good, I must tell him that one. I wonder if there'll be any difficulty. Well, not a bit, not a bit. Old Phipps always sees a joke. Remember that Christmas... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember that Christmas Eve when Arthur Brown filled his umbrella with cheese sandwiches? <laughs> yes, we do see life here in Whitehall, uh -huh. don't we? Ah, Stilton, I think it was. Yes. What I meant was, will these people sell their land? Oh, good gracious, yes. Tell you what to do. Send them a number one stiff letter. When they read that on our headed note paper, they won't stop to argue. All right, I'll go and get on with it now. Good. Now, I wonder if I need a number nine on this. Mildred, take a letter, will you? It's for Admiral Mumpley and Miss Chambers. Let's see. Dear Sir and Madam. Of course, I don't mean Sir and Madam on the same letter. I mean one on one and uh, the other on the other. If you see what I mean? Uh, yes, I think so, Mr. Lamb. Good. I wish I did. Now, where was I? Uh, 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 will you read that back, Mildred? Dear Sir and Madam. Yes, uh, dear Sir and Madam. Uh, um, you know, that might be a good place to break off for a cup of something. All work and no play makes Jack... Yes, yes, splendid. That's a good job done. Now, can I see those letters, Mildred? Here you are, Mr. Lamb. Thank you. Dear Sir, on one, good. And on the other, dear Madman. No. Oh. <laughs> really, Mildred, you must do something about these mistakes. No, no, alter it afterwards. I want to check the rest of it. Uh, pursuant to amended planning policy, an area of land which includes your property is urgently required for government redevelopment. And I am asked to negotiate with you for the sale thereof. Your early agreement will be appreciated. The government is convinced that any delay is a menace to the national welfare. And I am the same. <laughs> Your obedience, etc. Good, I think that covers it. I wonder what the Admiral will say to this. Hardy, <laughs> shut the flaming portal. Hey, oh, the window. Aye, oh, aye, Admiral. Can't hear myself curse. <laughs> oh, that's better. Blasted bureaucrats, bowler headed buffoons, black suited bounders. See this, Hardy? Aye, aye, Admiral. Totter rum, quick. <laughs> Load the cannon in the front garden. Run up the flag. Hey. And fetch me some paper and a good shop. Aye, aye, Admiral. Government redevelopment scheme indeed. Grab my land, would they? Ha! And what about Miss Chambers, that poor, weak, defenseless woman? I suppose the wicked old devils have one of these two. <laughs> uh, 
Come along, eat up, children. Move over, Puffins. Let the guillemots have a bite. Eat up, all of you. That's right. <laughs> We're going to have to fight for our home. The men from the ministry want to take it away from us. <laughs> yes, they do. But we won't let them, will we? No, we won't. Hello. There's someone coming up the path. Good gracious. Morning, Miss Chambers. Admiral Mumpley. Well, this is a surprise. Well, yes. Mind you, some people might think it's strange that we're neighbours and we haven't spoken for 15 years. They wouldn't think so, madam, if they'd seen what your puffin did to my blazer. Or if they knew... <laughs> or if they knew what your cutter did to my kitty wakes. Nonsense, madam, I... <coughs> this is no time for quarrelling. You and I have got to put our heads together. I beg your pardon? I suppose you've had one of these letters from the Ministry of whatever it is, wanting to take this place over as an army training ground. Oh, yes, I have. You'd better come inside. What impertinence. My family have been breeding puffins here for 800 years. I've written back and told them so. Good. But we've got to face the fact these people can use compulsory purchase. Can they? Well, I'd sooner die than have a lot of soldiers disturbing my shearwalters. Yes. Yes, but we've got to handle them carefully. Make sure you're behind me and I am behind you at the same time. <laughs> what do you propose, then? I thought we'd talk it over today. Then tomorrow I'll go up to London and see these people in their office. Find out how the land lies. Very well, Admiral. You're right. We must stand together. I'll make a pot of tea, and perhaps you'd care for a soft-boiled gull's egg. Mm. You can't think well on an empty tummy. Morning, one. I've had the replies from the Isle of Wight. Uh -huh. I'm afraid they don't look too hopeful. Oh, dear. Look, here's the Admiral's letter. Uh -huh. What's this? Infernal impudence? Hung from the yard arm? Bare-faced brigands? Bullying? What? It's a word here I don't understand. <laughs> I think it's a naval expression. Oh. <laughs> you see this as a refusal, do you? Well, reading between the lines, I do get that impression. <laughs> and Miss Chambers' letter seems much the same. We're little Hitlers in that one. Oh, dear me. Well, ask April to bring the papers into my office, will you? The legal papers? No, the midday papers, of course. <laughs> There's a horse running at Bogside this afternoon that I've been but told about. One... What are we going to do about this Isle of Wight business? What? We've made no progress, and war officers sending one of their top men over this morning oh. to see how we're getting on. One of their top men, are they? That's different. Well, we'll have to put up some kind of show, won't we? Make him think it's all buttoned up. Tell you what, have you got a big map of the island? Yes, I had one sent over. Good, well, I'll tell you. We'll spread it on the table and stick little flags in it, yeah. like they do in those war pictures. Oh, what a good idea. <laughs> but have we got any little flags? Yes, my top drawer's full of them. Kept them all from past flag day. Saves Barn again next year. <laughs> Here we are. This yellow one can mark the Admiral's place. What's it say? Home for retired horses. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Splendid. And Miss Chambers can have the accident prevention one. Uh -huh. I say, I'm rather enjoying this. I'll just slip out and tell Mildred to let the war office chap in when he comes. April's away on a typing test. Good idea, good idea. Now, where can I put this one? Mildred... If you could just tear yourself away from that copy of Biff, the teenage disc ground up for a moment, I want to tell you something. Sorry, Mr. Lamb. Mr. Hamilton Jones and I are expecting a man from the war office to discuss this Isle of Wight business. Send him straight in when he comes, will you? Straight in? Right you are, Mr. Lamb. Oh, I wonder if Bernard's in. Three, two, four, please. Oh, did you ever? Hello, Bern. Mildred here. No, I've got this place to myself. I've just got to watch out for some old square from the war office and send him into HJ. Here, Bern. I was just looking in Biff, and it says there's a big beat package show at the Buzzardrome tonight. <laughs> yes, they've got Charlie Frenzy, Laurie Lustful, and Fred Livid. <laughs> what about it? Oh, good. Where shall we meet, then? Oh, inside the buzzer drone. <laughs> All right. Here, burn. Uh, oh, it looks like the man from the war office. Hold on a minute. Good morning. Is this the office that's seeking to purchase land on the Isle of Wight? Yes, that's right. Would you go straight in, please? They are expecting you. Expecting me? But I don't see how they... That door over there it is. Oh, very well. Morning. Now, this Isle of Wight business, I want to find out... Oh, yes, of course. Come in, come in, come in, my dear fellow. Don't worry, we've got it all buttoned up. Huh? 
Uh, here we are. Sit down. Have a chair, won't you? This is Mr. Lamb, my assistant. How do you do? How do you do? I want to make it clear I'm extremely concerned well, about this. Well, of course you are. Of course you are. Couldn't be anything else. Might have been a tricky business, mightn't it? However, you'll be glad to hear we'll soon have these Isle of Wight people right where we want them. Huh? What? Mind you, we are having a little trouble with some old fool of a retired admiral. Oh, no. <laughs> What's his name? Mumpley. <laughs> we call him Mumps because he's an awful pain in the neck. <laughs> Just a stupid old windbag. We'll soon get the measure of him. Oh, you will, will you? There's him and the Miss Chambers, but they'll come round all right. We're sending them our number two stiff letter. They won't argue with that. They wouldn't want to get our number three stiff letter. Mm. Wonderful what you can do with a bit of bluff and a little brown envelope with a window in it. Yeah. What about... <laughs> What about compulsory purchase? Oh, don't worry. We know the War Office don't want compulsory purchase because of the publicity. Yes, but of course, these landowners don't know that, so the threat will be enough. I don't suppose as much they do know, living in a remote spot like that. <laughs> They're probably a bit simple. Yes, I say, can't you imagine that old fool of an admiral? <laughs> I bet he's got a cannon in his garden and a flagpole. <laughs> I expect he plays with boats in his bars. If they have bars. Unlikely to have bars in a place like that. More likely just to avoid each other. <laughs> I see. Jolly good idea of yours to use that spot as an army training ground. I've never been to the Isle of Wight, but from the map it doesn't look as if much goes on there. I wonder you don't use more of it, you know. Come to think of it, you could take up the whole island and use it as a rocket ray. What a splendid idea. I'm sure we could fix it for you. Yes. I'll just make a note of that. Good, good, good. Now, as we seem to have got things taped, I think we're entitled to a little celebration, what do you say? To get the brandy from the first aid. Yeah, camp, I've got you? it here already. Uh, you'd like a little brandy, Mr... Uh, Mr... Mumpley. Admiral Mumpley. Yes, of course. Well, you're very good health, Admiral... <laughs> <laughs> look, too, look what you've done. You poured drink all down Admiral Mumpley's trousers. Did you say Admiral Mumpley? I, I did, sir. Well, I rather thought he did. Uh, of all the unscrupulous, malicious, villainous, outrageous, obnoxious. Uh, 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 <laughs> so, war office don't want any publicity, eh? Well, let me tell you, before you get hold of one inch of the Isle of Wight, you'll have to face the biggest public scandal of the century. I'll write to every newspaper in the country. Oh, dear me, even the Sundays. Especially the Sundays. <laughs> we'll fight you every inch of the way. Ta! Ministry of Idiots! Useless parasites! You won't get away with this! I don't think he's going to cooperate. <laughs> Do you realise he called us the Ministry of Idiots? I do. And useless oh, parasites? Oh, my dear boy. Treat marks like that with the contempt they deserve. Ignore them like I do. Hello? Ministry of Idiots here? <laughs> no, I won't argue with that. <laughs> Engine here? War office can't send their man over. So they've asked me to ring you. What's happening on this Isle of Wight business? Oh, Isle of Wight. Things are definitely moving, Sir Gregory. Well, better move a lot faster. Yeah. War office want this land as soon as possible. But above all, remember, no publicity. Oh, dear, there's going to be a terrible row about this. And just when I look like getting a carpet in my office. I can't say I'm pleased with the way you've handled things too. Scarcely diplomatic. Should have left things to me. But when you specifically told me that Too I... late for diplomacy now, of course. No use offering our naval friend the olive branch. Probably just hit us over the head with it. Yeah. <laughs> but funny. I see. Right. Uh, you could try it on this Miss Chambers. I'll bet she'd be a pushover for that old world charm of yours. Well, not now, after the Admiral's told her about this little episode. Then we'll have to see her before he does. We order a fast car and go down there at once. It's our only chance. Teddy, don't lose your head. You can't go just dashing off like that. One has commitments, you know. Let me see. It's Thursday, isn't it? Yes, tonight, tonight, my wife has her friends round. You're right, we'd better go. <laughs> Quick, you authorise my expense sheet and I'll authorise yours. Good idea. <laughs> if we can get Miss Chambers to sell her place, the Admiral will have to come round. Well, this is the house, too. Mm. Can't think why Miss Chambers so anxious to hang on to it. Not in very good repair, is it? No, it looks as if it's only kept together by the Death Watch Beetles holding hands. <laughs> I'll knock. Now, look to, when she answers, I want yeah. you to let me do the talking. I wasn't in the diplomatic branch all those years for nothing, you know. Yeah, all right, you are one. You turn on the charm, and I'll put my foot in the door. I hardly think that'll be necessary. Yes? Oh, good afternoon. How do you do, Miss Chambers? Oh, my foot! <laughs> Kindly remove it from my door. I know you. You're the man from the ministry, aren't you? Now, come, 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 Miss Chambers. Can't we talk this over? We've come a long way, you know. Oh, very well. Come in. Thank you. 
I thought my neighbor, Admiral Mumpley, had already been to see you. Yes, thank you. Oh, wipe your feet, too. <laughs> yes, he's been to see us. Indeed, he has. Most cooperative and helpful. He's selling his property, of course. He is? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. It's very extraordinary. Yeah. I understood. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chambers, and you'll do the same now, won't you? I have the agreement here for you to sign. You won't want to stay when the Admiral's base is taken over by the army, get chased around by a lot of rough soldiers. Really? But you know, it's not so ridiculous as it sounds. Isolated spot like this, the strangest things could happen. How dare you? Anyway, a charming girl like you shouldn't be stuck in a place like this. Sell it to us, and, and you could have a bit of a fling while you're still comparatively young. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Well, you know, I meant, uh, I mean, I compared with a tortoise, for instance. <laughs> Some of those tortoises live to be 200, I'm told. So we over 50s have quite a long way to go yet, I hope. Kindly you? leave my house at once. No, 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 you haven't signed the bill of sale yet, Miss Chambers. Nor shall I. I do not propose to sell this property. I see. You realise, Miss Chambers, we can use compulsory purchase if we have to. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, good heavens. Not when the National Press print what oh. I've told them. Admiral Mumpley. I just got back from London. Saw your door ajar, so came straight in. Heard this bounder trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Take no notice. Don't worry, I didn't. I don't think the diplomacy was a great success one. Do you mind if I try another tack? Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, has it occurred to you, Miss Chambers, this may be your only chance to get a good price for the house? I mean, it's in pretty bad condition, isn't it? Look at all the dry rot in this panelling, for instance. Well, you've only got to bang it and... Oh, I say, I'm terribly sorry. Did you use that staircase much? <laughs> oh, what an outrage! It's fantastic. But wait a minute. What's that scroll of paper? Look, inside the broken panelling. Oh, I don't know. That, that panelling's been there for 800 years, and now it's smashed. I shall call the police. Come along, too. I think it's time we were off. This scroll must have been here all these years. Yes, look, it's parchment. Dated 1241. Good heavens, it's a royal proclamation. By this deed, we, Edward I, King of England, do give to Thomas Beowulf Chambers that piece of land known as the Isle of Wight as reward for loyal services rendered by Thomas Chambers in our foreign wars, and by his wife in his absence. <laughs> the said Isle of Wight shall be ruled forever by Thomas Chambers and his heirs, on annual payment to the British crown of forty puffins, given under our royal hand this first day of June, 1241. Oh, oh, great, what an amazing thing. Quiet, please. You see what this means, don't you? The Isle of Wight isn't part of Britain at all. It's ruled by the descendant of Thomas Chambers. And that's you, Queen Amelia. <laughs> and here is the news. An emergency meeting of the International Court of Justice at The Hague has upheld the newly discovered document giving the Isle of Wight independence. In swiftly moving developments today, the British governor was expelled from the island and Queen Amelia I was installed in Carisbrook Castle. <laughs> the Isle of Wight people are said to be solidly behind their new regime following an announcement by their Prime Minister, Horatio Mumpley, that there was a ministry plan to turn the whole island into a rocket range. In Moscow, Mr. Khrushchev called for an end to British imperialism in the Isle of Wight <laughs> and announced he would be visiting Ventnor on a goodwill tour. <laughs> He confirmed that Russian technicians were already arriving to help develop the island's economy. <laughs> and now here is a late news flash. Admiral Mumpley has been asked about rumors that Isle of Wight forces are massing in the Cowes area for an imminent invasion of England. <laughs> in reply, he said, We should like good relations with our neighboring island, but unless we receive an immediate guarantee of non-intervention, a state of war will exist. He declined to comment on reports that the Southampton Ferry recently seized by the islanders, had today shelled Bogner Regis. <laughs> stand by for further bulletins. Oh, April, switch it off, for goodness sake. I can't stand it. And it's all our fault. What are we going to do? Well, if I were you, Mr. Lamb, I'd throw myself out of the window. <laughs> Thank you, Mildred. But it's no use. I couldn't commit suicide to save my life. <laughs> the papers are calling it the biggest international crisis since World War II. My Bernard got his call-up papers this morning. He says it's the same old story. The flower of Britain's youth answering the call to arms. He thinks with any luck he'll fail his medical. <laughs> get, out, get out of the way, too. 
Ah, got that shot right at last. Thank oh, honestly, you, how on earth you can play golf at a time like this, I read. There's it. no sense in panicking, my dear fellow. You're on the established staff, aren't you? Yes, but I don't think even that'll save us this time. The Prime Minister's given us 24 hours to find a solution. Yes, a bit high-handed, I thought. Mind you, I think he's rather upset about those 40 puffins the other white people sent as payment. Oh, by the way, Sir Gregory says we've got to move the puffins from the conference room. Oh. It's the noise they make. People think it's the policy subcommittee in there. <laughs> the puffins, those beastly puffins. Every time I go in, there seem to be more of them. More of them. More puffins. Look, wait a minute, I think I've got it. More puffins. We ought to have more puffins. Mildred, fetch the first aider, will you, Miss Adams? Going no, off ahead. No, that Isle of Wight charter said an annual payment of 40 puffins. Don't you see? They've been failing to supply puffins for the last 800 years. Oh. So they've broken the charter. The island reverts to Britain. Yeah, but... Oh, 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 oh. By Jove, you're right. Yeah. She's right, yeah. April. You're marvellous. Oh, Thank you. Unless they send us a back payment of 32,000 puffins. <laughs> I somehow don't think that's likely to. No, I think we've got them beaten. The International Court of Justice is sure to reverse their decision when they hear this. Yes, quite right, quite right. I must ring up the PM and tell him I've found the solution. <laughs> Any post this morning, too? Only this card from Monte Carlo, from Admiral Mumpley and Miss Chambers. Oh, yes. Or I should say, Admiral and Mrs. Mumpley. <laughs> Are they enjoying their honeymoon? Apparently. And so they jolly well suit on the money the war office paid for their property, about three times its proper value. Oh, never mind that. It was worth it to get the whole business settled. It was one thing to prove the Isle of Wight still legally belonged to Britain. It's quite another getting the islanders to settle down again. I must say it was an inspired idea sending Wilfred Pickles on a state visit. <laughs> the main thing was to kill that stupid rumour about turning the whole island into a rocket range. Never know how that started. But uh, it was you who told Admiral Mac... Two? Are you still hoping to get an eventual upgrading? Yes. I'll never know how it started either. That's right. <laughs> anyway, I know what finished it. My official statement that all proposed rocket testing sites would be in Scotland. That's what finally killed the ill feeling on the island. Nothing worse, you know. Can't have chaps making trouble on your own doorstep when we... Excuse me, sir. What? But I thought you'd better see this immediately. Special edition of the paper. That's so late, but no need to. Uh... Oh, my goodness. Do you see this, too? What? Oh, no. Ministry rocket statement inflames Scotland. Scottish <laughs> troops invade a door. <laughs> Carlisle besieged by 10,000 Scottish soldiers under General Andy Stewart. <laughs> oh, no, man, this oh, is too much. I mean, much. I've never heard such... Muddling through as the men from the Ministry were Wilfred Hyde White and Richard Murdoch, assisted by Diana Olson, Norma Ronald, and Roy Dutrees for Great Britain, and opposed by Julian Summers and Joan Sanderson for the Isle of Wight. The men from the Ministry is written and produced by Edward Taylor. <laughs>